Welcome, Happy New Year. We're gonna call this RTC meeting for January 17th to order. Can we begin with a roll call? Commissioner Rodkin. Here. Commissioner Bottorf. Here. Commissioner Chase. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner Alternate Mulhern. Here. Commissioner Coonerty. Here. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Bertrand. Here. Commissioner Lowe. Here. Thank you. Okay, we'll begin with the oral communications. I just wanna have a little um, guidelines before. We are obviously here for one main reason today, uh, I hope, and uh, maybe we can focus on that issue. So we are gonna have oral communications, but I'd like you not to, to make sure you refrain from anything that has to do with the other things that are on the agenda. And uh, you can go ahead and line up and you'll have two minutes. Very good morning, commissioners and members of the public. My name is Jack Nelson, and I'm here for one main purpose also this morning. Um, uh, due to our beautiful rainy weather, I was compelled to bring my visual aid in a trash bag. And uh, what, what that is is just a symbolic representation of our planet Earth. You might recall that at your last meeting, I mentioned we're traveling together on this planet at a speed of 66,000 miles an hour in our annual orbit around the sun. And um, if you look at the surface of the Earth, you can see in many places you see mostly ocean. There was just a, a report out, a new study in Science, the journal Science. Uh, I saw a little news article about it, haven't followed up yet, but the scientists are telling us that our oceans are warming faster than we previously understood even though it was already known that 93% of the global heat produced by our greenhouse gas to atmosphere is being absorbed by the oceans. It's our credit card that's temporarily saving us uh, from uh, the kind of heating that will take place. But so we're, this is kind of the bathtub we're in too. So when, when this ocean warms, there's really kind of no going back. And so, uh, this is, this is the whole cost that we must not build. And greenhouse gases are, are the whole cost gas in this case. Um, not to mention uh, that recent study, uh, that for me piles on last April in Scientific, Scientific American, their Arctic meltdown issue, and this is meant to be upside down here. Uh, the researcher says, today I'm startled again because it now appears that the ocean will likely be free of summer ice by 2040, a full 60 years earlier than we had predicted, little more than a decade ago. The Arctic is changing exactly the way scientists thought it would, but faster than even the most aggressive predictions. The recent behavior is off the charts. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. My name is Marilyn Schultz. I am from La Selva Beach, but also having lived in Watsonville, Aptos, and Rio Del Mar. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. And I also appreciated the way all of you were looking at the first speaker. I didn't notice that last time I came here to speak, and I really appreciate it. I'm here today because I believe most of you will vote for the preferred scenario today. Ma'am, ma this is a general comment period, not about the Unified Quarter Study. I'll have to ask okay. you to come back when we do that. Do you know what time that will be? I do not know. My best guess will probably be an hour from now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry I misunderstood That's that. all right. Hello, I came in to introduce myself. My name is James Sandoval. I'm the newly elected general chairperson for Smart Transportation Local 23. Uh, we represent the bus drivers and paratransit in this county, and I look forward to working with you guys uh, to try to improve the transportation within this county. I'm gonna leave my business card, so if you guys need any information or have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. I have a video that I want loaded up. Does anybody have that handy? I'll let the next speaker go. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, welcome to the new year. Hope everything goes according to plans, uh, everybody's in their lives. And basically I'd like to uh, thank the commissioners as well as staff and even all the advocates out here for all the hard work they put into this uh, 
CFI or UCIS. Uh, for me, it's been two years of study involvement. Also, um, my friends at CFST. From the boardwalk. Hang on a second. It's not mine. Yeah, we're gonna pause that. <laughs> okay, continue. Okay. Sorry for that interruption. Hey, no problems. Um, I've had a personal one-on-one -on -one with some of the commissioners here and staff, written letters, tried to relay pertinent information throughout the last two years. Um, in intervals of two and three minutes twice a month. Um, I want to thank you all for treating me cordially and, and for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, I would imagine this gets pretty boring uh, all the time listening to the same things over and over. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, VMT, induced demand, uh, rail banking, various cost analysis by advocates and progressive rail issues. Um, but basically, guess what? This is part of your job is to listen to the constituents. Uh, and also take their um, things that they find through study and through efforts on their own to uh, heart and try to listen with an open mind. Um, I personally was hoping over the last two years to find someone or two or three of you that on this commission to be a champion for those of us who are adamant about the severity of climate change and would support projects that would help mitigate climate change and not exasperate it. I have a feeling today about uh, how things are going to go um, since this is 17th. I hope we can all listen to each other and treat each other with respect. And as we proceed through the ERR uh, by Caltrans on litigation, I hope all of us understand what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Josh Stevens here. I was originally going to start off with my script, but this morning I did the Greenway commute, trail only, bikes and e-bikes and all that, and I got a shredded rain-soaked piece of paper, soaked shoes and soaked pants. Now, now for the actual meat and potatoes of the, my speech. Um, so for starters, we've got median traffic speeds along State Route 1, commonly referred to as Highway 1, and they can be slow as five miles per hour after five in the peak commuter direction headed southbound, um, according to that bus on shoulder study. Um, these buses, our buses, they have to sit in the traffic on State Route 1 and uh, kind of shows to, goes to show the transportation tyranny in which we suffer. Um, when it comes to Santa Cruz Metro innovating on route offerings, only one route comes to mind, Route 91X, the current only local express bus route option. Um, it offers a time saving of 12 up to 20 minutes when traveling to Sa uh, Santa Cruz Metro, or from Santa Cruz Metro to Cabrillo College versus Route 71. Um, another key factor is um, of our transit tyranny is that we have really long transit times. For example, prior to the 2016 service cuts, we had former routes 56, 54 serving Capitola and Los Alba Beach, and one could take a trip from there as quickly as 12 minutes thanks to the Express Route 54. Fast forward to today, and that same trip takes a whopping 42 minutes, and you have to walk over well over a mile. Uh, let's see, another critical failure we've got going on is how some bus service trips can constitute three or more trips to make a single round trip. For example, you live in Rio Del Mar, you want to go to Aptos Deluxe Foods, you got to take at least three Route 55 buses because it only goes one direction. Uh, let's see, what else? And um, other factor I noticed is communications. Um, service disruptions delivered by uh, text message via GovAlert have not been coming through. On January 6th, there was a shutdown of Bay Street blocking five, bu or detouring five bus routes. There was no communication made. Um, so that's another issue on the hand. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Peter Stanger. I'd like to echo the comments of that last speaker. Uh, my commute from La Selva Beach today, well, there's no Route 54 for over two years now, so we get to ride our bikes or whatever to get over here. When we go along highway or along San Andreas Road, the bike lane is filled with debris. I've emailed Public Works, the hazard uh, website for um, the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission. I've even emailed my supervisor to get it cleaned up. No, it's not. It's that narrow as you go through a S-curve that's 40 miles an hour with cars in the rain. I get up to Bonita Drive, I have to make a left turn. 
with no turn pocket, no stop sign, <clears throat> the cars are coming off the freeway to take the shortcut, they don't wanna stop for you. And then I have to go along Benita where they're speeding along over 30 miles an hour. I get up to uh, near State Park Drive at uh, Aptos Rancho Road where I, when I go to the bank, push the button that says, for bikes to get the green light, it doesn't even work. I've re reported that for over two months now. Then I get up to um, app to Seacliff uh, to State Park Drive, where the bike lane disappears and a car goes whizzing by me, just about hitting me. Okay, then I keep on coming along San uh, along SoCal Drive hitting all the heavy traffic and whatnot with people. And then the irony of it is, as the rain's pouring down on me and I get to the county building here, I lock my bike up outside because that's where it is for us to lock up. And I'm walking in the front door. Who should arrive in a Tesla in the pouring rain, opening the door for his buddies, but the co-chairperson or co-founder uh, of Fort? Tell me. Did the guy take a metro bus? And, but he's gonna tell you how to do mass transit in this county? Let's just stay away from personal attacks. Okay, okay I didn't say you. anybody's name, but I just wanna say that you're being led by somebody and a group of people that don't use mass transit. Thank you. Um, that's an angry person, bad day, bad weather. Uh, my video, please. The video is about a minute and 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Okay. Okay, we're live from the boardwalk. This was taken in December of 2018, meaning just a month ago. This is RTC property. It's not under progressive control. It's under RTC control. It tells me that the RTC is out of control in how it can police itself. I have said this once and before. I have considered the management at the RTC not capable of policing itself. I also think that it shows that it rewards people who are in uh, support of their policy, which is pro-train. These are people who have received money either directly or indirectly from funding from the RTC. Those are not experts in planning or not. Otherwise, the RTC is in really bad shape. Um, and quite honestly, it, it either makes the RTC look very dirty or a hint of corruption. And I really don't wanna go down that path, but I'm telling you, this is what I have seen since I got started four years ago. Thank you, Thank you. Pico. Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Sarnataro from uh, Live Oak. I submitted some uh, written comments this time uh, on the subject of accounting, and uh, we'll change the pace. Uh, there's two ways to do bookkeeping and accounting. One of them is to take care of your taxes and just do the basics and just report things. The other one is management accounting, to provide information in a format that the consumers of that information can look at and easily see what the factors are and make decisions based on that. And I think that what and in my suggestions in, in my co written comments are, are more specific, but basically what I'm saying is that it would be really good if the RTC could break out things in the way that people are thinking about them. If people are thinking about um, the, uh, how maintenance is happening on the corridor, uh, if people are thinking about what the difference is between running buses and running trains, if people are thinking about the future in terms of what kind of tax is gonna be required to support what kind of, uh, 
what kind of uh, decisions get made, that really would be much better if you, you could just set up a few simple tables and communicate to people over multiple years what's happening. And again, your financial statements are always organized so that you just have one year or two years instead of giving that long view. So I'm encouraging management, especially the new management, to take a different look at how you report your financial data. And in relation to what the last speaker said, I also think that it would be good if the data that had to do with supporters uh, of the path that, that management is, uh, is forwarding, is going forward with, uh, had their specific funds uh, disclosed so that it was easy for us to see that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett. I have comments on the Highway 1 EIR. Is that during the Caltrans report or now? That would be during the Caltrans report. Okay, thank you. Hi, Gail McNulty, um, and Nadine Thorne has kindly shared her two minutes with me so that I too can share a video. Um, I'm going to share a video today of we a young woman. We can't combine time here. You just get two minutes, Gail. Two minutes. People do that all the time. I've seen other people My share two minutes. My name is Greta Thunberg. Okay. I am 15 years old, and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of Climate Justice Now. Is it longer than two minutes? It's three minutes. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Can you pause the Maybe video, they will please? ask why you didn't do anything pause it. while they're still. You can bring up the other speaker, and then I will let the other. Uh, Mr. Mr. Can, can I have the other speaker come up, please? And I'm going to let her finish the video, but I'm just going to curtail the time. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old, and I'm from Sweden. You only talk about moving forward. Can we get to the two minute mark. The same bad idea with the emergency break. You are not, you leave to us children can live in luxury. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. 
We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for that delay, Mr. Hurst. That's okay, I'm used to waiting around. Uh, Lowell Hurst from the west side, the uh, west side of Watsonville, 70, 17 miles away, 50 minutes about 21 miles an hour. So I'm here to give you a, a quick uh, traffic report from uh, the South County. You know, it was pretty rainy today, but the traffic was moving really well until you got to Rio Del Mar, and then it was dead stop. I saw about 12 tr semis on the road. Uh, a CHP officer had somebody pulled over. There were several tro tow trucks hauling cars away. And so there was a, there was a lot of action on the road today. What we, what, we, what we really need to focus on is moving Santa Cruz forward. And so I just want to share with you that, uh, you know, fo folks are trying their best to drive uh, as well as they can, but there's, a, but there's a lot of congestion, and whatever you can do to help move us forward, that's what we'd like to see. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close uh, oral communications and move on to uh, any additions or deletions to the uh, consent or regular agenda. Uh, so, commissioners, there are a few replacement pages for today's agenda. Um, item 7 has a um, revised staff report, which was provided to you. Um, item 11 has a uh, replacement page. Um, item 20, um, um, to, there's a replacement add-on, actually it's not a replacement page, it's an add-on page to attachment three and that was also provided to you. And then there's an item 20 handout. And, and commissioners, in addition, uh, legal, uh, the closed sessions listed on your agenda today will not be necessary. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to comment on one item, uh, number six, uh, project and planning items. Are you on the consent agenda? Oh, yes, get is it? Okay, no, I'll give it to you. Okay, so that brings us to the consent agenda, and uh, we'll uh, act on those as one uh, comment, unless uh, any commissioner has a comment. Mr. McPherson? Yeah. yeah, right. I just wanted to point out uh, publicly, this is a huge project that was part of Measure D, uh, the Highway 9 San Rosa Valley Complete Streets Corridor Plan. Uh, we are going to have some community open houses in Felton at the community hall on January 31st from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And in Boulder Creek, the elementary school multipurpose room, um, uh, February 6th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. This is a very important, um, we want to get some input from the pub public, but we, we're very happy to have this draft uh, plan for the Highway 9 corridor. It's an uh, important part for the San Lorenzo Valley. Any other commissioners have a comment on the consent agenda? Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I would like to pull uh, number 10, and you can either, I guess, now or uh, at the end of the meeting, whichever you prefer. Um, let's see. I think we can... Uh, let's put that with... Um, we'll put it at, at the end after we do the uh, uh, item 20. We're going to call that item 22, okay? Okay. Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Uh, thank you. Um, for item number nine, uh, this has to do with the accept the status uh, report for Measure D revenues and distribution. I'd like us to know a little bit more about the committee makeup that was um, appointed to evaluate or to take a look at what we're spending on the Measure D, maybe even a report from them in with this data so that we know, one, that they've taken a look at the finances on that, um, anything else that comes in conversation with that particular committee in um, how the expenditure of the D funds are, are being um, spent. Yes. Uh, yes, Commissioner, we'll be uh, producing uh, minutes for those committee meetings and those will be included in, in your agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Any other co comments? Anybody from the public want to pull anything from the consent agenda? C Commissioner Bordoff, if it is possible to um, 
go through um, item 10 um, immediately after um, uh, this, these comments. Um, it would be helpful. I'm worried about losing a quorum and, um, and um, there is a resolution attached to that and I would like to be able to move forward with, uh, with that item if, if possible. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. I'll move it in, uh, into a 19A then. Yes, sir. Good morning again, Peter Stanger. Is item 11 on the consent agenda? Yes, yes it is. Uh, I'd like to speak to that. Go ahead, speak to it now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have an issue with the Bicycle Advisory Committee and that is that it is really political appointees. Um, it's disheartening that people that are assigned to represent a district or are given representation because of a district do not have to reside in that district. So you can have somebody that lives in Santa Cruz representing Watsonville. Uh, you can have somebody that lives in La Selva Beach representing Scotts Valley. That person is not familiar with the roadways and is not familiar with representing the community and the constituents of the appointee. And that is a serious flaw in uh, the appointees that you have on your list. Um, I also find it disheartening that the people that are on this list don't even have to ride a bike. They might not be familiar with our roads. Ro our roads. They might not be familiar with our bike lanes or the lack of bike lanes. They might not be familiar with the lack of bicycle safety uh, and separation from motorized traffic or bike paths availability. It's nice to come up here to Santa Cruz, the land of jump bikes, the land of green lanes, the land of clean bike lanes, but in the rest of the county, we don't have anything going for us and these appointees don't represent the areas that they're supposed to, or that you'd think they're supposed to represent. And I really have a problem with the way that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation assigns them. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Anyone else from the public? Okay, I'll bring it back, looking for a motion for the consent calendar. I move the consent agenda as amended. I'll second. Uh, a motion sec by uh, Leopold, second by Coonerty. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously with the exception of the items that have been pulled. Okay, that takes us to uh, the regular agenda. We'll begin with uh, commissioner's reports. Any commissioners have anything they need to report? I see none, I just have one quick one here. Um, been on this commission for a little while and it's kind of become like a little family, but one of our family members is gonna be leaving us because she's uh, no longer gonna be a political figure. So um, we'd like to just take a little moment to acknowledge uh, Cynthia Chase and her years of service on too many commissions to number. I serve with her on Metro and RTC and I know she's been busy in every venue and I'd like to have uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Leopold present to her a certificate of appreciation from the RTC and all the members. Thank you, Cynthia. It's always on. Um, appreciate the time that I've um, been, had a privilege to work with um, Commissioner Chase, both at the Santa Cruz City Council and here, and we'll miss her very much, but I just wanna say, I, I don't think this, she's no longer gonna be a political figure, just not <laughs> an elected office at the moment. <laughs> Any other comments? Commissioner Chase. Is it working? I don't know that you're on. Does the green light? There's the green there we light. go, okay. Yeah. I'll make it brief, I know we have uh, a long agenda. I, I appreciate the acknowledgement and I actually really appreciated serving on this uh, commission and I said it actually in my last meeting with my remarks to uh, outgoing executive director Dondero. 
I had no idea how much I would enjoy learning about transportation, thinking about transportation, all the different modes. Um, I don't look at any community the same way now because I'm always looking at how do we move around each community and how can we improve that and what do we do well and what do other communities do well. And so I just appreciate the opportunity to serve on this commission and appreciate the relationship with all of you and I thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, let's move on to the uh, director's report. Thank you, Chair Borgo. Um, I have a few items to report on. Um, um, the first item is I would like to um, inform you that Progressive Rail notified um, the RTC that on January 7th, they removed the final four tank cars that were st in storage on the branch line and interchanged them with Union Pacific and Pajaro. I would like to thank um, uh, Progressive Rail for a job well done. Um, the City of Santa Cruz Public Work Direct, uh, Department issued a notice of intent to adopt a recirculated mitigated negative declaration for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Segment 7, Phase 2, from California Street to Bay Street and Pacific Avenue. The comment period started on January 7th and will end on February 6th. Um, I'm proud to um, announce that the RTC received uh, $250,000 in grant money from the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans Highway Safety Improvement Program, or HSIP, for pedestrian cross crossing safety projects on Highway 9 in the San Lorenzo Valley. The intersections where pedestrians cross will be improved with the <coughs> HSIP grant money um, include State Route 9 and Redwood Drive in Felton, State Route 9 mid-block crossing between Graham Hill Road and Kirby Street in Felton, State Route 9 Clear Creek Road in Brookdale, State Route 9 Forest Street in Boulder Creek, and State Route 9 Pool Drive in Boulder Creek. Um, that was a, a, a very uh, good announcement um, by Caltrans, and we're very happy to be moving forward with those projects. Um, once again, I'm going to reiterate the Highway 9 um, so San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets Corridor Plan and the open houses that uh, Commissioner McPherson told us about earlier. Um, it's very important that we get public input to those two meetings that, um, that were already announced. And if you ha um, have not seen that, that's an item six if you need a written direction as to where those meetings will be held. Um, Additionally, uh, Caltrans and FHWA uh, certified the final Tier 1, Tier 2 EIR and EA for the uh, Highway 1 Corridor Investment Program. The Tier 1 or planning level document is for the full HOV lane project from San Andreas Larkin Valley Road um, to Morrissey Boulevard. The Tier 2 or project level document is for the auxiliary lane project between Soquel Avenue Drive and 41st Avenue including the bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing at Chanticleer Avenue. I'm also pleased to announce that the RTC hired a new accountant to replace departing Ben Wolf. Keith Rayburn Garcia started work at the RTC on January 2nd. Keith has a BA in economics from Cornell University and is currently in the process of obtaining his CPA. Finally, the RTC has extended its search for a new director of finance and budget to replace retiring Daniel Nakuna. The position will be open until filled with an initial filing date of January 29th. A special thanks to Daniel, who has postponed his retirement for three months to allow RTC more time to fill this critical position. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Any questions on that report? Okay, um, this moves on to our Caltrans report. Ms. Lowe. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I would just like to let you know that Caltrans is undertaking a series of vulnerability assessments for the state highway system so that we have a better understanding of the, uh, number one, the climate factors, the multitude of climate and weather-related factors that can impact, um, that are going to be increasing in, in intensity in future years to look at the portions of the transportation system that are vulnerable, and then to develop and prioritize the types of improvements that we uh, need to make to be responsive and make the system more resilient and adapt to the changing conditions. 
Caltrans is conducting these uh, one district at a time. We just kicked off the, there's several that have been completed and on our website, I could forward the link to you if you're interested in looking at those. Uh, district four is complete, for example, uh, the neighboring district here. And ours for district five will be complete near the end of this calendar year. And um, uh, we look forward to uh, embarking on that together with you. We'll be sharing information along the way. And then our project information report is uh, robust. And to not take too much time away from the rest of your agenda, I'll just make myself available to questions. Are there any questions of the commission? Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Um, do you interact with the Coles Commission on these vulnerability assessments? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Caput. <coughs> With the, uh, uh, I don't have it in writing anymore, uh, the crosswalk at Marchant Street and uh, Highway 152 by Watsonville High School. I, I believe it's on track, but I don't see it uh, in writing anywhere. Yes, there, there um, may have been an update um, that isn't reflected in the copy that you received there. Um, we have a, a, a minor A project that includes that location that's on schedule. It's a, um, it's in the uh, preliminary phase, so it'll be constructed um, in the summer and fall. That, that or excuse would, me, that, um, yeah, it should, be, it should be by the end of the calendar year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is it time for questions from the public on the Caltrans report? I believe there was a comment. There he is. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett. I've been studying the EIR for the Highway 1 project, the widening of the freeway with auxiliary and HOV lanes. I'm very concerned that the EIR makes some new claims that seem to me very far-fetched and even contradict each other. The public has not responded to this these claims because they, some of them were not included in the draft. Um, the EIR literally says building extra lanes will reduce carbon emissions compared to the no build. Um, I, if I believe that, I might come around to support the highway construction because there is a climate emergency and we must reduce our climate emissions. But do you really believe that widening the freeway will reduce carbon emissions? I'm skeptical, to say the least. The report claims there will be less carbon emissions because traffic will flow more smoothly. Well, I'll believe that a car moving at a steady 35 miles an hour releases less carbon emissions than a car in a stop and go traffic. That's reasonable. But the report also claims there won't be induced traffic demand because the non-HOV lanes will still be congested. And even without the induced traffic, the VMT number goes up 29% compared to no build. And somehow the diverted traffic will magically disappear from the Soquel Avenue, even though the freeway is still congested. There's, the, the report just seems to contradict itself in many ways. Um, one of the more interesting calculations is near the end of Appendix K in a memorandum called the Estimation of Induced Traffic Demand and Congestion-Related Costs Memorandum. Um, they seem to be saying there's a thousand miles of roads somewhere in the vicinity of the freeway, and the new freeway lanes add a small percentage of that. Therefore, the induced traffic will be small. It's not logical. It makes no distinction between lanes in a freeway and lanes in a cul-de-sac. It's based on a 3% increase of total lane miles in the area. It's calculated exactly the same lane way as if we had a 32-lane freeway and added a 33rd lane. So Caltrans is saying build more highway lanes to reduce carbon emissions. It's preposterous. It's a dangerous precedent for the rest of the state. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Before we have any other speakers, I'm going to make sure that your comments are limited to the Caltrans report. That was a little bit, anything like that would probably be more appropriate in the UCAS comments. So if the other speakers are in that venue, then I would wait for that. Um, Brian Peoples, Trail Now. Been in um, transportation for over 30 years. Um, I actually am an engineer for Lockheed Martin, for the chief engineer's office, so I do a lot of engineering stuff. So I've been studying, and I did read the, Cal the EIR, the Caltrain report, and w totally support the highway widening on that spa aspect. I, the report's good. The engineering aspects of it are sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my intention is to say a few words about the Highway 1 final EIR. Are you saying not appropriate? I think it'd be more appropriate when we get to the UCIS because it's going to be more appropriate of that conversation. Thank okay. you. 
And I think that's what we're here for is to get to that topic. So we're gonna continue moving on. I have one other item that we need to deal with and that is a 19A. This is uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, your concerns on this item? Uh, were, was there gonna be a staff report? I, there can be, yeah. If you wanna go ahead and bring that up and do that. Thank you, Ms. Sheck. <coughs> Good morning, my name is Ani Shank, I'm RTC planner. Um, we've uh, spoken before about the need and desire of staff to provide uh, improved mobility services and bring us up into the era of providing a one-stop shop that's easily accessible through phones and through the internet for people to be able to view bike share <coughs> options, um, transit options, uh, as well as ride sharing options. It doesn't preclude other modes, but this service would allow us to provide a, um, a much more robust trip planner it would also allow us to work with employers to distribute employee benefits, commute benefits to their employees, to uh, conduct workplace challenges, to um, conduct regional challenges similar to <coughs> what uh, you might have seen with uh, Bike to Work Day this last year. So it's a full service platform that really would allow us to communicate uh, at a much broader level with members of the public as well as employees at large employers. And I'm happy to answer questions. We've talked about this at, at a couple different staff reports, but I know that we didn't have quorum at one of those meetings, so. Let's see if we have any questions. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, not so much questions, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think we've been here before, uh, probably three or four years ago. Uh, the RTC took on uh, some of the um, requirements or basics from the Air, uh, Air Resources Board. They had an incentivized program in order to help with commute solutions. Now, the RTC um, had to give that money back because the program was such a colossal failure. Instead of providing, you know, the goals, that, uh, meeting the goals that were promised, it was just a fraction of a fraction. So you had people with, quote, you know, and I read in this report, anchor employer, employee, employers that were part of this program uh, the employees were given uh, little gifts, you know, uh, incentives, uh, and it didn't work. And so the money that the RTC took, they had to give back to the Air Resources Board. So this is kind of a, that is a cautionary tale on programs like this. Now this is a 511 program, number, number one, that has been funded already. We have a commute solutions that we provide two full-time employees for. Uh, at about $250,000 per. So asking another $65,000 for a program like this, that has been shown that, it, that you know, the intentions are good, but the results are always not so good. So my problem is um, Commute Solutions, we, we pay a lot of money for those types of programs, but at the same time, we don't gauge whether or not they're successful. I've asked staff many, many times, what is the before and what is the after? How, how successful is this program? And they can't answer because, you know, uh, software problems, we can't do this. Uh, I'm reading from the bottom of page 10.3. The $20,000 that RTC approved in December for dy dynamic ride matching program did not come to fruition, okay? So we spent $20,000, it didn't come to, well, I'm just reading what was in the report. Um, so I'm really not in favor of spending another $65,000 on, uh, quote, a, uh, 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 a, a one-stop trip reduction ride sharing program uh, when uh, the past has shown that this has not been successful at all, and it's just really a waste of money. So that's, that's how I feel. Any other questions before I open it up to the public? I'm just looking for questions at this point. Uh, let me get Ms. Uh, Ms. Coppin going this first. I think I had a similar type of question. Um, $65,000 for software. Uh, where did the last dynamic ride matching pilot, per why did it fail? What do we know about that? And it looks like it's gonna be assigned to the city of Santa Cruz to work on this project, is that correct? And um, otherwise, are we looking at a, a particular company? So is this going to be going out to bid? So those are the kinds of questions I have with this particular line in the um, packet. 
Did you want to address those? Yeah, there's actually a number of questions I'll okay. address, um, kind of working backwards. This would go out to bid, so we don't have a particular company in um, in mind. Um, and it's not necessarily assigned to the city of Santa Cruz. This would be a partnership with the city. Uh, they have a downtown TDM program that they'd like to kick off. They want to use this type of platform. So they've um, uh, approached us and asked to partner with us on this. I think it would be a great, res uh, great way to spread out resources and get the program kicked off uh, with a sufficient number of users. Um, the uh, previous pilot program for the scoop did not come to fruition, meaning we didn't even start it, so the money was not spent. Um, we were not able, in order for a program like this to work, you have to get a few large employers in your database so that if a member of the public goes to use the system, they'll actually find a rideshare match. And um, we were not, um, because of the method that Scoop uses after investigating it, we were not able to get a couple of large employers on board. We do have, we've been in communication with UCSC. Um, we also, because of the partnership with, down, with the city of Santa Cruz, we'll know, we know we're gonna have downtown employers on board as well as UCSC providing a few thousand employees right off the bat, which would give us a, a sufficient number of users in order to engage people and for them to find uh, matches. Um, and in terms of gauging success, this pro the software platform, unlike other platforms that we've looked at in the past, um, now there's a whole slew of providers out there that in this kind of commute management system, it's called commute manager, but really it applies to any type of trip, whether recreational or event. Um, they provide for surveys. So the city of Santa Cruz does their own baseline survey for downtown Santa Cruz. We would do a baseline survey for other employers not within the downtown area and then be able to compare that once the pilot program has gained some momentum to see if um, or how VMT and greenhouse gas reductions may have been affected. Um, Commute Solutions and Cruise 511, just for clarity, that is the same program. Commute Solutions was rolled into Cruise 511. It's the new branding. Uh, so we, it's not two separate programs we're funding. It's, it's just this one program. Um, and we don't, we might have FTE equivalents, but we don't actually, uh, at, it's a small agency, so we all wear multiple hats. This is not the only program I work on. We do have a couple employees that are working on this program, but neither of us are working full time on it, just to clarify. And then uh, my final question on that is, um, I'm not hearing anything about Watsonville. What are you doing to engage Watsonville to um, work with this? Um, because mm -hmm. obviously South County is coming north, and w I just wanna know what involvement engagement we're having with Watsonville in this. We've contacted the city of Watsonville staff. They don't have the resources to um, engage quite on the, the same level as city of Santa Cruz staff. However, they are going to connect us with a couple of large employers to involve in the anchor phase. And um, will also provide us with some translation services for when we do our outreach. So they are able, to, we're working with them. Um, we also know from our commute patterns, there are a number of Watsonville residents that are working within either the medical complex or downtown Santa Cruz, and we plan on engaging those employers as well in the anchor phase program. Thank phase. you. Mr. Mendez, did you have a comment you wanted to add to this? Or I just wanted to say, I know uh, uh, Commissioner Johnson was providing some, some history on the, the efforts of uh, Cruise 511. And, 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 it, and it is true that the, the RTC does, you know, continually work to, to um, improve the services it provides to the community by engaging new technologies and so on. And, and unfortunately, when, when we're doing that, engaging new technologies, the, there, are, there are challenges and, and that uh, Commissioner Johnson is correct. We did have a challenge in the, uh, a few years ago when we did get some money from the Air District uh, to, uh, to make that effort. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the consultant that uh, was hired, you know, not all of that the consultant promised would be delivered got delivered, and that was that was the big, you know big problem. And um, the RTC didn't actually give money back to the air district; it was on a reimbursement basis. And the RTC did get paid for some of the work that was done, but basically then you know didn't get reimbursed for some of the work because again the project wasn't fully delivered, and um, because of the, you know the partnership with the consultant didn't work out as as the RTC had hoped. But we continue the efforts to try to deliver the services to the community. 
in the best possible manner. And this is, you know, of course, you know, technology improves and so on, et cetera. So now we feel we're you know, in a better spot to offer these services and the, the companies that do this have uh, developed significantly since that time. So thank, thank you. Commissioner Mulhern, you had a question? Uh, thank you. Um, are there any plans to create a true mobility as a service platform that integrates ride share, bike share, card share, public transit, all into one app mobile application? I see that your plans are to integrate some of these services into the website, but are we looking at an integrated mobile application that includes all these different ways that people can get around? That's the concept, yes. Um, to some extent, it, it depends on the um, bike share and other providers uh, providing their data. Um, so I know that depending on the company that we end up hiring for this, there's varying degrees of contracts and relationships that different companies have with um, Ubers and Lyfts and Jumps and Limes out there. So it would, it would probably partly depend on um, who we hired and the ability or the willingness of Uber and Lime and all those companies to provide their APIs as well as their data to us. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, I'll go ahead and open up to the public for any comments on this topic. Hi, Brian Peoples Trail now. You know, Randy, I was at the meeting where you pushed back on it and truly, um, let me tell you guys my experience with this. You know, 25 years ago, I was on the other end of this. I was working for the corporations, promoting commuter <laughs> programs, arranging shuttles to Caltrans. I worked in the Bay Area for high-tech companies. It's totally engaged with MTC, which is the Bay Area Transportation Agencies, understanding how they're trying to recruit ride sharing and everything. So I was on that end, and I mean, I was deep in it. I'd actually even written a state bill to promote that kind of thing back about 10 years ago. It got killed in committee. But the short answer is, you know, I, I have a lot of experience with commuter programs from the corporate sense, and it is difficult to reach out to the employees to get them. We were giving them cash. We were saying, take the bus, ride share, network systems. We never really developed an internal. Um, some companies would do a, you know, a search where you can find your partners, but we relied on the, the Bay Area agency. Where we're at now, though, with technology, with WAS and, and all that, and, the, and the, the Ubers and the Googles and the, even Facebook, um, a local small agency like yourself should not be trying to develop software to, to support this. I think Randy was right on when he said that's not our charter. You can't do it. I've been there 25 years ago. I was on the other end, you guys. Google's doing it, they're having buses. Um, you staff for other areas. You've got plenty of work. You've got plenty of work to do. You got more reaching out to the community, not for those ride shares, but for other aspects. So that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Welcome, Ms. Fleischer. Good morning. Claire Fleisler, City of Santa Cruz uh, Transportation Planner. We are really excited to partner with RTC on this project. As you may know, we're expanding our downtown employee transportation demand management program and offerings. We currently have about 56.5% of our downtown employees who drive alone to work, and our goal is to drop that to below 50%. Um, comparatively, the national average is over 76%. So in the city of Santa Cruz, we're about 20% below that. And that's based on all the investments that you've heard that we've made over the years. We uh, think that this program is absolutely necessary to be able to monitor, incentivize, report, and measure on our success. And now we're at a time where this tool is a type of thing that can be available, and it's how people are accessing transportation services. The first thing you do is pull out your phone and see, is there a jump bike near me? When is the next bus coming? Is there a way that I can get an emergency ride home or be matched with a carpool? And having a program like this enables people to have a one-stop shop to figure out what are the mobility options at their fingertips and make it easier and cheaper to be able to get around our community without needing to drive for every trip. So we're really excited in the city that RTC is taking the leadership on this to bring this project forward. We hope that you vote yes on it and we're looking forward to partnering. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jessica Evans and I, um, I'm actually really interested. Try in, to get a little closer to the mic, okay. There. Um, I'm interested in seeing this project um, implemented 
in maybe in stages because personally I really care a lot about being able to get on a bus and use my phone to pay for the bus. I care a lot about being able to look at my phone and see when is the next bus coming, where is the bus, when is it coming, and then being able to use my phone to pay for it. I, I'm not sure if an app that tries to put carpooling and jump bikes and Uber and Lyft onto one app would be, to me, that just seems really overwhelming. Like, and I, you know, maybe you guys will do it and it'll be awesome, but like, could we just maybe start with an app for Metro so that people can actually know when the bus is coming and pay for <laughs> the bus with the phone? Thank you. Good morning. I'm all for an improved Cruise 511, but I need to know, will I finally be able to find where my bus is to see if it is I or said bus that is late? When I tried Cruise 511, all I saw was a Google Maps widget trip planner pasted into the web page. Is this my Measure D tax dollars hard at work? The idea of pushing commuter benefits is great. I am thankful my employer offers this. Focus on commuter benefits and none of the gamification. The Bay Area, if I recall correctly, mandates commuter benefit offerings for all employers. This is a real solution. Being able to use pre-tax commuter benefits has incentivized me to use public transit more than I would have before. The current Cruise 511 program caters to cars. All I want to see is where my buses are and service disruption announcements. Why is it that transit agencies in every other direction that isn't us can do this? Even Los Banos can track their buses and figure out where they are. <laughs> The current service disruption text alert system is late or is never reported. Highway 17 detours yesterday due to a mudslide were announced via GovAlert text messages, but not until well after, over an hour after KION covered said detour. Another example is Halloween day when buses had delays due to half of the bus lanes being shut down on the Pacific Avenue side of our downtown metro. There was radio silence on the text messaging forefront. Please focus on communicating public transit and not cars when revisiting Cruise 51 or when revising Cruise 511. I also ask that the board consider using one of their commute solutions staff to monitor re Metro radio communications and push out service disruption alerts. Maybe even use the CEO out of office, stream the radio communications feed to the smartphone and push text that way. There are many ways to communicate these events with little to no money involved. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring it back, uh, Commissioner Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, the uh, 511 service has been, uh, w when it was in creation, was, there were people who could not conceive how that would work. Um, and what we saw uh, as soon as it got put online uh, during the 2017 storms, that it was a vital, critical resource uh, for people in our community. Uh, adding to the, in, uh, an, or enhancing the capabilities of uh, 511 seems to make sense. Uh, I will also point out that uh, the Transit District recently received a grant uh, to do uh, uh, um, um, what people are asking, which is that we could, you could know when your bus is coming. Uh, I don't know exactly when that will be online, uh, maybe within the next year and a half. I'm, I'm looking to uh, uh, staff, they might be able to come up and, uh, and just give a brief report about that. Uh, but uh, the, the transit district is committed to that. The board made that a priority and the staff went out and got the money to make that happen. And that could be tied in with this service. Uh, I don't, Mr. Clifford, maybe you just wanna say a little bit about that uh, service. Go ahead, Mr. Clifford, thank you. Sure, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, yes, I was smiling as the comments were made earlier about what the value would be in a smartphone application showing the timing of your next bus at your stop. Um, as as uh, the Metro board members know, we received a grant uh, through the STIP program, but funded actually as a result of SB1. Thank you, SB1. Thank you, Prop 6, for going down. Um, and that is funding an AVL project, an automatic vehicle locator project. So we, over the course, 
course, we've already awarded that, so over the course of the next year, we're putting that on our system, uh, installing GPS on our buses. As soon as that is done, that will tie into the smartphone application, and we will launch our own application. Um, we will then move on to looking at other types of, of partnerships. For example, there was a discussion about a single application being able to do jump bikes and Ubers and things like that. That does exist today. So it's just a matter of whether we can integrate with that down the road, but that's exciting that we have that coming. Um, I just wanna make one last quick comment on the, the Gov delivery. We're trying to do our best on that. That is our way of notifying our, dry, our customers that there is a problem with the service and it is delayed. If you go back and visualize what happened last night, it was it was in the evening that we had the mudslide, the tree later in the evening that the tree came down. We have one dispatcher working at that time who has to jockey keeping service on on uh, on the road and rerouting that service around those kinds of problems and then running over to the gov delivery and making a notification to our customers. So it's a delicate balance. We try to do the best we can and I'm also trying to avoid adding another FTE that it would take to have somebody sit there and just be dedicated to that particular program. But we can do better and we'll keep trying to do better. Well, th thank you uh, for that information. I'm sure the public will be very happy when that uh, uh, gets introduced. I, I would like to move the recommendation in the board packet. A motion, second by uh, Commissioner Mulhern. Let me get a comment from Mr. Commissioner Rodkin first. Just one, just one sentence for people who think this is cheap. What Alice Mike. Clifford just yeah. microphone. For people who think this is cheap, what Alex Clifford just talked about is gonna cost the district over a million dollars to put GPSs on all of our buses and all, everything else that comes with it. So these things, it's, it's great we can do this. We've, we've needed it for a long time, but the choice has always been what routes would we cancel in order to have this service? And we, because of Measure D, we're now in a position to be actually able to fund, to fund this and actually have this uh, real significant improvement to the district. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mulhern, you had an amendment? Uh, yes, thank you. Just a f further direction to staff that the request for proposals require that a successful applicant possess the capability of integrating with mobility as a service and other transportation service providers in the county to provide an integrated map. The maker of the motion okay with that amendment? I'm just looking over at staff to make sure that can be done. I, I, so That's a yes. I, I see that as a friendly amendment. Okay. Any other comments from commissioners? Commissioner Johnson. Uh, right, so you know, I'm not um, inherently opposed to innovation. I think uh, on the face of it, something like this, a platform um, is um, moving forward. But at the same time, I guess I'm just questioning how it's being paid for with new funds instead of extracting from what is existing in the either 511 pool of money or the uh, commute solutions pool of money. There's lots of money there. And having to extract it from Measure D, which in, in my mind, uh, maybe it's uh, appropriate, but at the same time, uh, you know, $10,000 here, $10,000 there, pretty soon you're talking about real money, and this is real money. So for that reason, I'm not voting against the opportunity, the innovation, but I am voting against the monies coming out of uh, what could go to other programs that might help with the efficacy of our transportation system. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Okay, with that, we'll have a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, one. That passes uh, 10 to 1. 11 to 1. Okay, that'll bring us back on track to the agenda. We'll be at item number 20, which is the main reason we're here today. This will be for the Unified Corridor Investment Study. Uh, staff uh, have a staff report. Ms. Dykar. Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. I'm up before they come. I'm getting her to say two things. Oh, no, you can't. The whole room. Just stand out. Shit. The staff report will be approximately 10 minutes, so I don't know if we want to continue to have people standing or. 
it's the, the length of the staff report is 10 minutes. You're welcome to stay standing, but just giving you a warning that that's how long it's gonna take. I don't see anybody budging, so go ahead, Ms. Dykart. <laughs> Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Ginger Dykar. I'm a Senior Transportation Planner here at the RTC and Project Manager for the Unified Corridor Study. It's been a privilege to be the manager for this study, given all the um, engagement from our community. Uh, the item I will be presenting to you is the final report of the Unified Corridor Investment Study and staff recommendations on the preferred scenario, the determination of exemption of the Unified Corridor Study from CEQA, and the grant of Phase Two of the Agreement with Progressive Rail. This commission, RTC staff and consultants, partner agencies, community organizations, and members of the public have engaged in quite a process over the last couple of years in discussing the transportation needs of the Santa Cruz County community and the best approach forward. Much appreciation goes out to all who have been engaged in this project. I wanna thank you all. As an example of the engagement, on this project, uh, included in the packet for this item, there are approximately 500 emails or letters that have been sent to the commission. <laughs> Since the packet went out last Thursday, we have received approximately 600 emails or letters with comments on this item and as were provided to you as a handout today. The objective of the Unified Carter Investment Study was no small feat to identify transportation improvements for walk, bike, transit, and auto that support an integrated transportation network on three primary routes through Santa Cruz County, Highway 1, SoCal and Freedom, as well as the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, was a substantial effort. Funding was sought and provided from Caltrans through, through two different grant awards in addition to funds from Voter Approved Measure D. A travel demand model was developed for Santa Cruz County that, that could be used to help facilitate this analysis and for use in future work. Consultants were hired to perform the analysis, Kimberly Horn and Strategic Economics, and RTC staff worked very closely with the consultants in providing local knowledge on projects, reports, and available data. The goals and performance measures were identified based on the triple bottom line analysis of environment, equity, and economy the Caltrans guidelines, what was feasible to evaluate given available data and tools that are available to our county. And last but not least, input, the goals and performance measures were, were uh, based on input from the public on issues in transportation that are most important to them. A range of measures, 16 in total, were evaluated to provide decision makers and the public with information about how future transportation scenarios affect the measures or issues that are most important to them. A performance-based scenario analysis approach was used as a well-accepted mechanism for bringing information to support decision-making. Outreach to this community, uh, let's see, I skipped a slide here. Outreach to this commission, the public, partner agencies, RTC advisory committees, community organizations was extensive through surveys, workshops, focus groups, stakeholder meetings, emails, including over 40 outreach activities. The quantitative step two scenario analysis of over 14 projects, 16 performance measures, providing existing conditions and forecasting for five different scenarios was quite an endeavor. Today's staff is seeking your acceptance of the final report of the Unified Carter Study and the preferred scenario. The staff recommendation on the preferred scenario includes the following. For Highway 1, the projects include six sets of auxiliary lanes between Soquel Drive and San Andreas Road, metering of on-ramps, and bus on shoulders between San Andreas Road and Morrissey Boulevard. On Soquel and Freedom, the staff recommended preferred scenario includes buffered protected bike lanes, pedestrian and bicycle improvements to intersections, and where feasible bypass lanes for bus service and transit priority. On the rail right of way, protection of the rail right of way for a high capacity public transit service on a dedicated facility, freight service and bike and pedestrian trail. The staff recommendation for the preferred scenario was slightly modified from the November 15th staff recommend, recommended preferred scenario. Included in the packet, there are a number of letters from partner agencies that are attached to the staff report that express support for various different projects to be included in the final preferred scenario. 
Um, it was uh, uh, omitted by, um, uh, not, not intentionally, that since the last discussion of the Unified Corridor Study on December 6th, the City of Santa Cruz City Council, in discussing the Unified Corridor Study, made a motion to include in its made a motion for the RTC to include in its final decision on the preferred scenario. The City approved multimodal intersection improvements on Mission and Soquel, and in the additional lanes on the Highway Braun Bridge over the San Lorenzo River. The preferred scenario advances the goals of the study, safety, reliability, and efficiency, and economic environmental and equity goals of the transportation network. The key considerations, the pro oh, I don't know what happened there, okay. Um, the preferred scenario protects the rail right of way for multimodal, transit, freight, and bike and walk trail. The preferred scenario provides flexibility in determining the most appropriate high capacity public transit service as a dedicated facility on the rail corridor. RTC staff will work with Metro to determine the scope of work that includes a high capacity public transit alternative on a dedicated facility on the rail right of way within an integrated transit network for Santa Cruz County. The preferred scenario also emphasizes regional projects that improve the connection between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. The preferred scenario provides a range of transportation options that meet the needs of all users, and funding for highway, transit, and bike and walk projects are often available for different sources. So by prioritizing a mix of projects and being shovel ready with environmental review and uh, project design completed, Santa Cruz County can be more competitive for funding. With the completion of the Unified Corridor Study, the, the, the Regional Transportation Commission can now make a decision on phase two of the agreement with St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, which is a subsidiary of the Progressive Rail. As a reminder, after extensive negotiations, ample due diligence, uh, excuse me, ample due diligence and several public meetings, in June of 2018, the RTC approved entering into a 10-year agreement with St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. Phase one of the agreement, which was approved in June 2018, allows St. Paul and Pacific the right to use the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line for freight. Within 120 days after completion of the Unified Corridor Study, which is specified as March 15th, 2019, the RTC must decide whether to grant phase two of the agreement. This will give St. Paul and Pacific Railroad a non-exclusive license to use the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line for excursion service subject to the RTC's approval of the operating plan, which is required to be submitted within one year. If phase two excursion service is agreed upon, the agreement specifies that the RTC will repair the rail line up to a class one tra track classification within three years. If RTC is unable to complete the repairs in three years, St. Paul and Pacific's excursion service requirements are extended accordingly at no penalty to the RTC. Once the repairs are made, St. Paul and Pacific is responsible for maintenance of the rail right of way. Granting a license to St. Paul and Pacific Railroad for phase two of the agreement, the excursion services, provides the greatest assurance that the rail right of way will be protected and maintained for future transit services and a bike and pedestrian trail. If phase two excursion service is not extended to St. Paul and Pacific, they could terminate the entire agreement. However, only the Surface Transportation Board can relieve St. Paul and Pacific of its common carrier freight obligations. Although there are no specified damages to the RTC for failing to grant a license for phase two, the excursion services, there is considerable uncertainty as to what would happen to the freight rail common carrier designation, as well as the RTC's ownership of the Santa Cruz branch rail line, if St. Paul and Pacific chooses to terminate the entire agreement. The resolution that is included as attachment one of the staff report provides the details of the staff recommendation based on the results of the Unified Corridor Study. The resolution includes the request to approve the notice of exemption of the Unified Corridor Study from CEQA, since in accepting the Unified Corridor Investment Study, there is not approval of a project, nor a commitment to a definite course of action with potential impact on the environment. Acceptance of the Unified Corridor and the staff recommendation provides commission support of the Unified Corridor Study as the comprehensive corridor plan that is required as part of the application for Senate Bill 1, Congested Corridors Program funding that will be sought for Highway 1. 
It also provides an acknowledgement that the Unified Corridor Study included an analysis of future transportation use options for the rail right of way, as discussed in Measure D. It also provides acceptance of existing conditions data and 2035 forecast. The existing conditions transportation data that was compiled for all the performance measures provides a substantial level of information on the Santa Cruz County transportation system and can be utilized in applying for funding, for project funding. The acceptance of the Unified Corridor Study also protects the rail right of way for high capacity transit projects, freight and a trail for bike and walk. The acceptance of a preferred scenario will assist in guiding staff to advance priority projects by prioritizing a mix of projects and being shovel ready with environmental review and project design completed, Santa Cruz County can be in a much more competitive position to be awarded funding. The staff recommendation before you today is for the Regional Transportation Commission to consider the findings, the final draft Unified Corridor Investment Study and adopt a resolution, which is attachment one of the staff report, accepting the Unified Corridor Investment Study, which selects a preferred scenario, also a part of the um, attachment one. It determines this action to be exempt from CEQA. The second part of the resolution is to, uh, I'm sorry, the staff recommendation is to grant St. Paul and Pacific Railroad a license to use the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line to provide excursion services in addition to freight services as specified under uh, 2.4.1 of the Administration Coordination and License Agreement entered into on July 16, 2018 by the RTC. That is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions and comments. Frederick Venter, Vice President of Kimley Horn, is also here. He's also been Project Manager of the Unified Corridor Study on the uh, consultant side. He's also here to respond to questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Tyco. Uh, commissioners, this, this portion is just for questions only, and then we'll open it to the public. So if you have any questions, we'll take those now. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Was there ever uh, a study done to the effect that if you have an excursion train, what effect would that have on the traffic um, uh, on Highway 1? How much would it diminish uh, the traffic on Highway 1? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a big part of, you know, you, you mentioned it, so I'm just wondering, was that part of the study? That was not part of the Unified Carter Investment Study. Was there a reason for that, or I mean, Part of what we're trying to do with passenger rail, excursion and so forth, is to diminish the number of trips on Highway 1, especially during the peak times. So why wasn't that included in the study? I think that, I don't know, maybe I can get it started and Luis could um, add to this, but the um, part of the commitment to the California Transportation Commission in accepting the Proposition 116 funds is to have some sort of passenger service and the excursion to trains does qualify for that excursion service. So it's just a stepping stone towards uh, meeting the obligations and accepting those funds. Thank you. Do you want to add anything to that? It looks like uh, um, Mr. Venter would like to add something, so go ahead and then I can add to that if. I think the excursion trains would not have the frequency um, and um, capacity that a, a, a typical passenger service would have. Um, it would also be more um, on for recreational purposes. Um, so I think the impact on, on any of the street systems for recreational or excursion trains is, is going to be um, minimal in terms of its impact on capacity on the road system. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, Mendes. If I may add uh, briefly, uh, in the Unified Corridor Study, the excursion services that's looked at is between Santa Cruz and, and, and Davenport. Uh, however, I mean, if, if the commission makes that uh, available, uh, there can be other excursions, um, and one of those that was proposed by the, the existing operator is to uh, have an excursion from San Jose to the to the boardwalk during tourist times and so on. So we know tourist traffic is you know is is also uh, a significant uh, factor in the uh, uh, congestion that, that we see here. So things like that you know could uh, give those tourist options for getting. Uh, to Santa Cruz and around Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, uh, if necessary. Um, of course, that was not analyzed because that was not part of the Unified Corridor Study. Any other questions? Yes. Let me get to Commissioner Bertrand first, then Rotkin. So Capitol has been waiting for some time for a report on the safety of the trestle that goes across the river, runs through Capitola. 
and um, that should have been done significantly many years ago. Um, it's due in 2019, as mentioned in the report. Um, seems to me this could be a major impediment for any kind of commercial use or uh, mass transit use on that particular line, depending on the cost. Um, if this comes in rather high, uh, what do you project in terms of the contract, the ACL? It could be much higher than we're able to afford in this community. So I'll take that question. Um, that's been a concern of mine as well. Um, I've been looking at the amount of, of work and repairs that would be needed on the branch line to actually allow this type of service. Um, we don't have that report yet. There is the possibility that there could be significant work on the Capitola trestle that exceeds um, the uh, available funding that we have um, to, to put towards the branch rail line. Um, that's why we put in our staff report um, the, the requirement that we repair the line, but um, the acknowledgement that if we were unable to repair the line that there really is no penalty to the RTC. So I really see no harm in moving forward with um, the class, uh, the phase two license with Progressive Rail um, because we still have the opportunity to possibly get sections of the rail line up to um, uh, the standards that would be required for excursion travel and be able to um, then transfer the maintenance uh, responsibilities over to Progressive Rail. So even though there's this unknown with respect to what the maintenance costs would be to initially hand the line over, without there being a penalty associated with it, I still see there being benefit in um, allowing excursion travel and, and, and handing over whatever maintenance I can to another operator. Can I have a follow up, please? Oh, go ahead. Thanks. So, as everyone in this room can imagine, and as everyone who are residents at Capitol can imagine, um, any kind of accident that's on this trestle could potentially impact not only real property, but life. So, having that train go over the trestle at a low speed that is deemed safe is not acceptable. If the report comes out that there's actually some issues with this trestle, and there's been many letters to this body and um, significant other things that make me wonder about the trestle safety. I think this is a major importance to Capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, is, is there a uh, Commissioner Rodkin? I have two. <coughs> I have two quick questions. One, um, it, it says in um, on page 2011. I've got the right page here. In the, resolu in the resolution on 2011, uh, number eight, um, says protect the rail right of way for high capacity public <coughs> transit service, goes on. I wanted to check whether uh, personal rapid transit is considered a high capacity public transit mode for the, for the purpose of, you know, was, would it be or, or could it be included in the um, study that's proposed here in terms of our options that will follow our, our action if we approve the uh, staff recommendation? I think it's a, it's a distinct possibility. Um, we would have to look at exactly what, they're, what they are proposing and whether it, it, it truly meets the d definition of high capacity public transit. But it's not ruled out automatically is because it's that is it's correct. particular character. That is correct. Thank yeah. you, that's question one. And, and question two, in the um, UCIS there's discussion about programs to enhance employer support of electric vehicle purchased by their, or used by their employees, a number of other kinds of options to sort of right now, not waiting for all these other programs that are gonna take several years to develop. But there's nothing in the resolution that comes back and refers to that part of the program. Would I be, should I be nervous that because it's not in the resolution that's not gonna happen or tell me, where does that now stand? It's part of this, preferred scenario when you read it in the text, but it doesn't show up in the resolution. And again, I, I don't expect you to tell me what the program is today and its details, but is that in fact a program that staff will be working on to make sure that it gets developed in the short term? I mean, the, re the resolution wasn't, wasn't meant to um, sort of reiterate ev everything in the preferred scenario. Uh, so if it's not in the resolution, if it's, if it's you know, something that, the, a plan that the RTC approves, it's still part of the RTC policy. So yes, we would work on you know, whatever you, you approve and direct us to. 
That answers my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're if you're wondering about whether you should applause or not, let's refrain from that. There's many different modes of transportation that we all support, and I don't want anybody to feel offended if their transportation doesn't get the attention it deserves. So <laughs> we're all here for transportation. So thank you, uh, Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have forwarded uh, many questions to staff that um, I'm sure I'll wait to hear back from, but there's a few of them here publicly that I think that I'd like to have a little bit more information about. Um, how long and at what cost will a full analysis of specific operations and capital funding sources take for the, um, the, the mass transit on the corridor? So for the, comparing the bus rapid transit to um, the rail option, how much time, how much money, um, what would be entailed to do that? It, it would really depend upon the scope of, of the work that we uh, define. And so I'm going to have to work with Metro um, in accordance with uh, the recommendation to come up with a scope of work. Um, there was a very um, good letter from Caltrans about potential funding sources in the agenda package. Um, those are the <coughs> sorts of things that we, we are going to be looking towards. But that said, um, it's very hard to, to lock down uh, potential funding sources um, and get definitive answers with respect to that. So, um, you know, I caution everyone to, you know, not get too excited <coughs> that um, all this funding is available and it would definitively come to Santa Cruz County. Um, but we should be able to provide um, a, a fairly good analysis as to, you know, what the options are in, you know, within a one-year period. Uh, another question, uh, probably a little bit further off on that, is what are new starts and small starts, the documentation requirements? There's something in the report that mentioned that, and I don't know what new starts and small starts mean. The Federal Transit Administration has um, some funding sources that they call new starts and small starts. It used to be um, required to do an alternatives analysis prior um, first, before you move into the environmental review, but their requirements have changed so that the alternatives analysis requirement is within their environmental review um, in order to expedite the process. Um, and I'll, I'll just ask one more out of everything I have here. Um, some of the conversations that I've been having are people wanting to make sure that I validated information beyond RTC's opinion, which I've done my best to possibly do. Will we be able to direct staff to ask specific questions of the STB and other government agencies regarding um, the, this corridor re and the restrictions and what we can do, what we can't do? Because there's a lot of things that, we'll, that I don't think we're directly asking the STB. We, we don't have STB coming in here giving us reports on some of the things everybody's assuming that we need to get directly the information from other um, federal agencies. Or, so it's important to remember that the Surface Transportation Board is a board. It, it is, um, it doesn't meet very frequently and it's not very well staffed. Um, so trying to get direct answers as to what would happen for certain different <coughs> hypothetical possibilities is a very difficult thing to do. It would be the equivalent of somebody coming to me and asking me what my board would do. Um, I don't know what you guys will do on a regular basis. So I can only look at the guidelines that are provided and that the laws that kind of govern them. They're primarily interested in protecting freight traffic as, um, you know, as mandated to them by the Interstate Commerce Act, which is a 19th century law. Um, they tend to favor freight traffic, and they're mainly interested in, in maintaining freight traffic on the line, and there is processes for abandonment and even rail banking, but there's also processes for petitioners to petition and also for uh, financial assistance if you're claiming that it's not financially viable to maintain um, freight traffic on the line for somebody else to take over and possibly even purchase the line. So that's why we mentioned the, the uncertainties 
there, we can certainly try to contact the um, board, but my guess is we're not going to get very direct act, um, answers. They're probably going to give me some sort of answer like, well, you would have to actually file to abandon the line to find out whether or not abandonment would be a possibility. Um, and I just have the one final, if that's okay. Um, uh, the investment equitability is something that uh, I know that we're concerned about the South County. We've had millions of dollars in projects at the North End, and I want to know how we're going to make sure that this is part of the process to make sure that we're getting the, the equitability of the projects balanced so that we actually can see some um, relief as primarily the south end when we've seen a lot of money spent on the, the north end. How are we integrating that into the, the study, the, the decisions and the priorities? I can, I can start with that. If you, um, so there's, there are some Measure D funds that are available and those funds are allocated on a formula basis and that has already been decided by this commission as well as the local jurisdictions. Watsonville um, was very involved in, in those negotiations for the Measure D allocations. Um, beyond that, discretionary funds for projects that go through RTC, that's only about 5% of the projects that, 5% uh, of the transportation funds that are available um, in our county, and they are not formula-based, but they always come before this commission to make a decision on where those funds would go to. Thank you. And, and one more thing with respect to the equitability question. Um, even though a lot of the improvements uh, focused on Highway 1 are not in the Watsonville area, um, it's important to, to understand the way Highway 1 works and where the traffic is coming from. A lot of the traffic um, commences in um, Watsonville or the, the, the vehicles commence in Watsonville and then they hit the traffic in um, uh, Aptos, uh, Capitola, and Santa Cruz. So even though a lot of the investments on Highway 1 were focused um, outside of the Watsonville city limits, there is significant benefit to the Watsonville residents. And this is true too if, uh, you know, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Trail goes all the way from Santa Cruz to Watsonville and any uh, mass transit service on the line would also serve Watsonville. I have Commissioner Caput and Commissioner Johnson. Go ahead, you Commissioner bet. Caput. Uh, I uh, appreciate all the work you're doing here, and we're trying to uh, we're trying to please everybody, and and that's good. Uh, what I, I'm trying to get out of here is that we find opposition to any shift in priority. Uh, what brought everybody here with Measure D was we were promising to a lot of groups, uh, and, and they got a sense of priority. Okay, what I'm I'm not against the rail. I'm, I'm for the rail, and I'm not. And I and I want to protect the uh, bicycle paths and the walking and trail use. And uh, is there a shift in priority? My, what I'm getting at is we're talking about passenger and freight service connecting Watsonville and Davenport, Santa Cruz. That's a that's a priority, and then. <clears throat> There is a caveat that says uh, we will look in uh, at uh, metro use uh, and uh, you know um, HOV uh, use and everything like that. If there's a shift in the priority to that bus capacity, would that basically break up the linkage between Santa Cruz and Watsonville as far as passenger service and uh, freight service? Um, I can get that started and then um, add on if you prefer. Um, so the, a lot of this would be determined in the future if the um, staff recommendation is to look at high capacity public transit service and the commission makes that decision today, then we also are directed to work with Metro to develop a scope of work to evaluate public transit service whether it's bu bus, BR, bus rapid transit, or rail, and um, all of that decision making would come back again to this commission, as well as I would imagine Metro, to make that decision of how best to move forward and what to evaluate. Um, the bus rapid transit that we did evaluate in the Unified Corridor Study on the rail right of way did connect Watsonville and Santa Cruz. I can't imagine that wouldn't be um, something that would move forward in our evaluation. Um, it just, uh, the option was that the um, 
bus would travel on Highway 1 from 129 to State Park Drive and then get on the rail right of way. Yes. So, but all of that is still, um, if, if this um, staff recommendation moves forward, then it would be coming back to the commission as at what exactly we would be evaluating as far as these alternatives. Yeah, right. I, and I'm getting at, uh, you shouldn't be under so much pressure here because it seemed at one time everybody was for the same thing, rail, trail, and bicycle path. And then now we're talking about priorities. So you're doing very well. I want to thank you. Uh, if I read this correctly, right now a priority is rail and uh, uh, passenger service uh, and freight service connecting Santa Cruz to Watsonville with the possibility of looking at uh, Metro and whatever in the future that might change that. Before there might have been a, shi a shift in priority where uh, passenger service and rail and uh, uh, freight service was a lower priority uh, before. So it, 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 am I reading this correctly? Freight and passenger service tends to be a priority right now? So if, w once again, with respect to freight traffic, um, the Surface Transportation Board is, is the governing um, body regarding freight traffic. Um, we have a 10-year agreement with uh, Progressive Rail, and um, I don't think that there's any um, desire to remove freight traffic from Watsonville. So, so freight sh should be continuing on the line, and, and there should not be an issue with prioritization of freight. With respect to passenger travel on the Santa Cruz branch line, um, coming out of uh, our recommendation is to do an additional analysis as to what is the best type of passenger service, transit service, high capacity transit service on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. So we do have a priority of trying to determine what that would be. Um, in terms of prioritization of other projects that could help relieve congestion and um, move people between Watsonville and Santa, and Santa Cruz. We, um, our recommendation is to move forward with the auxiliary lane projects and also to incorporate bus on shoulders within that. So we are moving forward in many different directions to um, continue and prioritize service between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Okay. And, I, and I believe I might be correct, Caltrain, uh, Caltrans would be, uh, is, is supporting uh, passenger and freight service between Santa Cruz, Davenport, Santa Cruz, and Watsonville. Yes, absolutely. The, the uh, state rail plan uh, lays out the vision for California's rail system, and the uh, Santa Cruz branch line is a, is a key component of that. We have both short-term, mid-term, and long-term expectations for how um, how all the rail systems would, would link up, and this is an important link. We right. support it wholeheartedly. And, and part of that would be, um, okay, I'll make this quick. The, um, if it, I'm looking at it from the uh, benefit to the Santa Cruz area now. I mean, I can argue I really want it for Watsonville, but the benefit from Santa Cruz, if we had freight and passenger service connecting to Watsonville, the state of California with uh, uh, funding for trains would then connect them to Monterey County, Salinas, Gilroy, and potentially uh, Seattle, Washington, and San Diego, California. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so if we had a break in the service between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, where they couldn't get on a train and actually connect to all the other uh, proposals by the state of California, Santa Cruz would be cut off if there was a break in that uh, train passenger service. I'm talking about that corridor between Rio Del Mar and what, uh, Porter, Capitola. <coughs> The branch line is an important connection. So if if the if the 
if the rail line was broken, it wouldn't be served. So well, any, any break an anywhere would, yeah. would stop that being able to get on a train one place and actually connect to, like I said, Seattle and San Diego. Okay. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a Prop 116 question. It, you know, Prop 116 was a Clean Air and Transportation Improvement Act of 1990. And, you know, embedded in that, um, was, I mean, we're always talking about rail service and the excursion train, I guess, would be a, a placeholder uh, to uh, protect the 116 funds that were given to this uh, agency. But if you look at Prop 116 and, uh, and how it describes it, there's also 20 million for competitive bicycle program for capital outlays for bicycle improvement projects that improve safety and convenience for bicycle com commuters. So my question is this, even though most of the, um, I guess, information that flows on the um, CTC's requirement for this line, isn't there also a, a possibility for that $20 million to be used for b bicycle and bicycle only? My understanding is when the CTC awarded us to use Prop 116 funds to purchase the rail line, they were very specific <coughs> in that they wanted to see it used uh, as a rail line. Um, I received uh, a letter um, via George, the previous uh, executive director, uh, dated November 2nd that reminded us of this requirement. So um, any action to try to change it would require us to go back to the CTC and ask them these sorts of questions. But um, my staff has informed me that at previous CTC meetings, commissioners have said flat out, you better not rip out the rails. So to go back and ask them to try to change what they decided when we purchased the rail line and allow some other use of the funds for another purpose would be um, very questionable. Well, I'll just add that I was in the room for many of those discussions with the California Transportation Commission as well as Caltrans, and I spoke to virtually all the CTC <coughs> commissioners when we made, uh, when we received this funding. This was their big issue, that we were just going to take this and turn it into a bike trail. They had us make commitments. They had us, uh, w we did uh, manage to put in uh, the excursion service rather than completely committing to passenger service because we weren't sure we, what, we, what we would be able to do there. But uh, at the time, um, uh, several years back, 2011, 2012, this was the big concern and it's been reinforced by the many of the letters we've received from the CTC since. Any other questions on this side? I'm, I, I'm gonna get everybody a chance first before we go back. Questions on this side? Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. So I know it's something that I've looked for for a long time in terms of um, accountability. On page 2011, the whereas number nine basically says that we're going to do a cost benefit analysis working with the Metro in terms of trying to figure out what the best high capacity public transit <laughs> alternates are on the, um, the right of way. Um, I commend that, and I think that came from Metro in an earlier meeting, and I commend uh, RTC staff for putting this in the resolution. There was a comment earlier in terms of how this body reports financial information to the public. Uh, can we present that information in a way that's understandable to the public and to the staff here so I can understand it? Thank you. Thank you, okay, no other comments. Okay, I've, uh, I have a couple things I wanna do before I open up to the public. Number one, so I wanna thank uh, Ms. Dykar, Ms. Blakesley for all the hard work and the rest of staff that you've done to make all these presentations and answer all the questions of the public. So now a round of applause for those people. Okay. And, uh, and number two, before we have the first public speaker, a couple things, we're gonna limit this to two minutes. Uh, but what I want to bring up is I want to bring up one of our stakeholders, since I believe we're fortunate to have the person here and on, on the dovetail of Mr. Bertrand's questions about Metro. I think it would benefit everybody if we heard from the CEO on Metro about some of the concerns that they may have on this study. So I'm going to ask him to come up front and share with him part of the presentation, Metro's concerns or comments on the ECIS. Thank you, Mr. Clifford. 
Mr. Chair, uh, commissioners, thank you so much for that uh, professional courtesy, thank you. Um, yes, I just uh, want to report, uh, as, as you well know, uh, the Metro Board took an action uh, uh, expressing certain concerns following the presentation of the report and the recommendations in November. And uh, I'd just like to say, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, and my, my board members will correct me if I get this wrong, but I'd like to say that I really think that what you have before you today meets both the spirit and the intent of the action taken by the Metro Board. I'm really impressed with the uh, leadership at uh, the RTC. Um, I really appreciate the time that Guy has spent uh, looking at our concerns over the holidays in particular, spending quality time looking at those concerns and trying to find solutions, asking good questions. And uh, I'm here to tell you by my read of what you have before you today, I, I think it is a really good outcome. Um, it, and, and it went further than to just say in a board report what was intended, but to put certain key things into the resolution which were important to us. We'll get a chance to continue the this new spirit of collaboration in the coming months and, and years and hopefully beyond that, but in respect to this, we'll get to work together, to collaborate together, to develop a scope of work that hopefully tries to answer the concerns that the staff and the Metro Board expressed in that previous action and thoroughly explore what the costs are of the different high capacity solutions. We're not here to tell you that uh, bus BRT and that quarter is the right one and you ought to do that today. We're not here to do that. We're just saying everything, train, that, PRTs, if that's what's gonna be uh, considered, all need to be evaluated so that the most cost effective approach is ultimately recommended to you. And with that, you will have all of the capital costs associated with it through this process. You'll have all the operating costs, but you'll go one step further. You'll go one step further to evaluate where would that money come from. That's such an important question to have answered. And that was, that was probably the most important thing to both the staff and our Metro Board. Whatever decision is ultimately made, whether it is bus BRT or train or PRT or whatever, you, you, when you make that decision, you need to know where that money is coming from. And if that source of money is something that Metro already uses today to provide the service that we just barely can, can do, and we desperately need to increase frequency in some cases and span of service and, and other solutions in the county. If that diversion of money is going to impact us, you'll know that and you'll know that as a part of your decision and you'll, you'll make a conscientious decision about that down the road. It's a great process. I wanna thank Guy and his staff for all that they have done and, and I'm here to encourage you to adopt the uh, recommendation and resolution that you have before you today. Thank you for the opportunity and the professional courtesy. Yeah, thank you for your comments. And we welcome our first speaker. Thank you. Marilyn Schultz, La Selva Beach. Train, train, train. It makes me really sad to see that some of you haven't folded on that idea yet. I think St. Paul's taking you for a ride. I think that because I'm from Minneapolis, St. Paul, the metropolitan area, 15 years ago, I joined my sisters for a wonderful bike ride in the country in Lanesboro. They had taken out their railroad tracks. They had put in bicycle paths to be used for that, pedestrians, and cross-country skiing. Minnesota's moving forward. We're moving backwards. No wonder Minnesota wanted some place to send their trains. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here today because I believe that most of you will vote for the preferred scenario today and I urge you to vote no. I rode the Christmas choo-choo train with my family. I'm against an old-fashioned train, even if it's not as bad as the Christmas train. I'm not necessarily against a well-planned light rail train. If it makes sense financially, and if we have the population to merit it at some point in the future, it'd be really awesome. We could put it on a platform above Highway 1. That would be a really logical place to have it. I recommend railroad banking for right now. And I recommend a use of the corridor for bicycles, walkers, and e-bikes. The technology is changing fast. We're just going to get buried in the past. The corridor was purchased to help the transportation gridlock. 
the train has been shown not to be a feasible solution for this problem. So now the train is being touted for, really. Thank you for your comments. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> Lesson for everybody. <laughs> Gail McNulty, I speak to you today as a mother, deeply saddened and worried about our children's future. My children are seven, 11, and 13. Scientists give a 50-50 chance that the human race will go extinct in their lifetimes. Transportation is our biggest local source of CO2. The UN announced in October that we have at most 12 years to dramatically transition off of fossil fuels and lower our, emis our emissions if we hope to protect a livable future for our children. The preferred UCIS scenario you are being asked to approve today will have little to no effect on our tr local transportation emissions by 2035. To make matters worse, this ineffect ineffective plan would sacrifice countless carbon sequestering trees and green space and eliminate the opportunity to build a wide continuous trail that would be a viable alternative for cars for many. While individuals, um, and at a time when humanity's only hope is to keep fossil fuels in the ground, the only true beneficiary of this plan would be Progressive Rail, whose leaders have strong ties to the oil industry. While individuals can and should make sustainable choices, decisions like the one you are considering today are far more impactful than anything we can do in our personal lives. Unfortunately, politicians at every level of our government are so ingrained in a get the money mindset that they mistake getting grants, making money, and bolstering businesses as taking care of people. It's time for a Green New Deal. Thank you for the climate improvements you have brought to your cities and the county. Based on what we now know, all efforts must be re-examined, intensified, and fast-tracked. We must go back to the drawing board and create bold, fast -track, a bold, fast-tracked plan to move more people more quickly while protecting our trees and our atmosphere. Our children need us to take the time to draft a more effective, less harmful transportation plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNulty. Welcome. Hello, I'm Susan Cavalieri. Thank you for this opportunity. I just want to say that this is not 2016 when Measure D was approved to add auxiliary lanes to Highway 1. Since then, CO2 level levels in the atmosphere have increased. Wildfires have destroyed forests, homes, communities, and lives. Smoke from these fires made the air hazardous for health. In the fourth California climate change assessment released in August of 2018, scientists report that wildfires will increase, water supplies from snowbank, snowpack will decrease, sea level rise, sea levels will rise, temperature will increase, and there will be heat related deaths, more heat related deaths by 2050. They say reduction of greenhouse gas emissions must be a priority to decrease severe climate impacts. And as Gail mentioned, the new IPCC report released in October of 2018 warns that the world has only about 10 years to drastically decrease emissions to keep the Earth's temperature under two degrees centigrade. Um, otherwise, there will be catastrophic environmental damage. Instead of auxiliary lanes and highway widening, which um, would support a business as usual scenario and fossil fuel use um, and increase greenhouse gas emissions, please fund electri electrified public transit with bus on shoulder, rapid bus rapid transit on SoCal, new options such as PRT, and Although rail is less carbon intensive, it may be limited by sea level rise and coastal erosion. Our collective survival depends on ending fossil fuel dependence. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rosemary Sarka. I'm a corporate officer at Roaring Camp Railroads. Um, we think that our experience might be relevant. Uh, and assuage some of the concerns of people who fear trains going through your neighborhood. You know that we have been running an old-fashioned steam train at, uh, in Felton for over 50 years, but a mere 35 years ago, we bought the branch line uh, from Felton to uh, the Y. 
uh, we ran freight, we picked up freight on that line up until 10 years ago when the recession made lumber coming into San Lorenzo at the Felton Yard not feasible. And we have run f trains coming from back and forth right through downtown Santa Cruz, right through neighborhoods uh, for 35 years. I just wanna tell you that the number of complaints that we have received in that period of time from the community has been zero. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, uh, good morning, I'm uh, David Van Brink, City of Santa Cruz and Friends of the Rail and Trail. This has been going on for a long time, something like uh, three decades if you go all the way to the beginning. And six years of studies wrapping up with the UCS. We just got a great turnout for the trail groundbreaking, three, 400 people uh, on a weekday, which is pretty awesome. The more we look at it, the clearer it gets. The more we look at it, the more organizations weigh in in favor of transit on the corridor. We've got letters of support from UC Santa Cruz and Caltrans, support from the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, the Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce, Bike Santa Cruz County, the Bicycle Advisory Committee to the RTC, the Elderly and Disabled Committee to the RTC, uh, the Friends of the Rail and Trail, of course, uh, and the tireless professionals of the RTC staff itself. The correspondence log for this meeting shows literally, uh, which I mean here literally, hundreds of individuals supporting rail and trail. Years in the making, let's move forward today, let's close the deals, activate the corridor, and approve the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my morning. name is Anna Kammer, and I live in the city of Watsonville. Um, today, you, we, all of us, are tasked with making a transportation decision which will affect the future of all county residents. All ages, all levels of mobility, families, students, working people, singles, residents, as well as visitors, commuters, and recreational users. The lack of reliable economical transportation creates an equal access barrier to educational and job opportunities throughout the county. And this is especially true for South County residents. Much of the county population, especially in Watsonville, is youthful and will benefit from planning now for future rail transit to access these educational and job opportunities. Rail will provide a high capacity public transit service to meet the transportation needs of all county residents. Rail transit is fast, it's comfortable, and it will equitably serve the over one third of county residents who live south of La Selva Beach. I urge you to approve the corridor study with the staff preferred scenario and authorize phase two of the progressive rail contract. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Good morning, commissioners, chair. Uh, my name is Bruce Sawhill, city of Santa Cruz, friends of the rail and trail. First of all, congratulations on the UCIS. So my message is that rail and trail is good for planet, people, and profit. In terms of the planet, it has come out very recently that transportation is the single greatest source of greenhouse gases. Both, both bicycles and electric light rail get upwards of the equivalent of 600 miles per gallon per person, whether they're running on burritos or electrons. That's what we need to turn the tide against climate change. In terms of profit, rail equals commitment to the long term. Long term commitment drives associated investment. This has happened all over the country, mostly with private dollars. In terms of people, transit on the corridor is a no-brainer. The corridor goes through all but one of the dozen or so densest census tracts in the county. And that transit should be rail, as the National Transit Database tells us that rail transit costs 40 to 60 cents per passenger mile, and bus is a dollar to a buck 10. Those cents add up when you're removing 80 million vehicle miles from roadways, according to the UCIS. Rail also conquers the infamous Aptos Strangler, and the scenario, at least the scenario C, bus plan, stops short. Other bus plans may not. This is important for accessibility and equity for the entire county. So build the trail as soon as possible, save the tracks, and please move forward with the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Sally Arnold, um, resident of Santa Cruz County since 1976. We need to build this trail as soon as possible, and the best way to do that is to stick with the existing plan. Please vote to keep the tracks and to authorize phase two of the progressive rail contract so we can keep an active rail line in place for future transit. Casual cyclists like myself could really benefit from having a safe, car-free level bike path to get around the county. And when built, this trail will pass within, 92 par within a mile of 92 parks, 45 schools, half the county's population. It's gonna get a lot of use. And as for transit, we already have the tracks. Why tear them out? They can provide much better service for cyclists than buses. Rather than having to hoist my bike onto a rack in front of a bus, assuming it hasn't already been filled, I could just roll my bike onto a light rail car and suddenly be biking in Aptos and Watsonville, places that are too far for me to get by bike now. Um, a lot of people are talking about climate change and absolutely it's important, and that's why rail Transit is so important. It will lose less, use less energy. It gets people out of their cars. It'll, it'll encourage more people to get on their bikes. Uh, please approve rail transit on the corridor and extend the progressive rail contract. Thank you very much for your comments. Hello, Mark. Good morning, Chair Botroff and Commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional engineer, and I'm the chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. Friends of the Rail and Trail fully supports the staff recommendations except we urge you to save us taxpayers the time and cost of the unnecessary alternatives analysis comparing passenger rail transit to bus rapid transit. The Unified Corridor Study has clearly demonstrated the superiority of passenger rail transit over bus rapid transit. No further study is required. No amount of additional study will dramatically change these fundamental conclusions. Rail transit will attract 75% more passengers will provide 35% faster travel times and cause an overall increase in a public transit use of 25%. Furthermore, rail transit is eligible for substantial state funding and will seamlessly connect us to the coming state rail network. Stating a preference now for passenger rail transit will save precious time and taxpayer money and move us toward a more sustainable, more equitable transportation future as soon as possible. Friends of the Rail and Trail urges you to fully support staff's second, rec second recommendation and authorize phase two of the progressive rail contract, allowing passenger rail excursion services. Doing so is the strongest way to demonstrate a commitment to use the rail corridor for high capacity public transit service and has many benefits, including it will allow construction of the very popular coastal rail trail to be done as soon as possible. It unequivocally protects the rail right-of-way and all associated easements. It keeps the Measure D promise to maintain the rail line and will save us taxpayers millions of dollars by shifting the maintenance cost to a private party. It avoids the time-consuming and who knows how expensive property rights litigation. And it will get residents and visitors out of cars, off our streets, and enjoying car-free access to parks, beaches, and other scenic destinations along our beautiful coast. Thank you. Thank you. I have a handout, and I'm going to let the next person go so that the handout can make it out. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Come on up, Mr. Anderson. Uh, <coughs> Buzz Anderson, uh, resident of Live Oak. Um, what does uh, $10 million get you these days? What does $100 million get you these days? For that matter, what does a billion dollars get you these days? No one really seems to know. The original figure for the east span of the Bay Bridge was $1 billion, and final cost, not counting demolition, approached $6.5 billion. The California bullet train began as a $33 billion project, but now estimates are as high as $98 billion. One thing is certain, however, there is a finite amount of money available, yes, even taxpayer money. As we've seen with segment 7A of the rail trail, engineering estimates have been way off the mark with anticipated bids of $2.2 million, but actual bids coming in at $7 million. Why doesn't the RTC staff start with a more difficult section on the rail trail so we can get a clearer picture of actual costs? Perhaps they are afraid of what it might add up to be. 
How much more money than the 15 million allocated will be needed to bring the old tracks up to a level of safety to handle diesel locomotives and heavy freight cars? How much money will it really take to retrofit or replace a trestle like the one in Capitola? And what about the real cost to bulldoze a rail trail between the existing tracks and topographical constraints throughout the corridor? And how about the cost of these massive concrete retaining walls? What about the price to control erosion when the sea terraces in La Selva Beach start slipping into the sea, or when the cost of land use disputes multiply as we tear into people's backyards or encroach upon farmers' fields? And who gets sued when an RTC repaired section ends up derailing a fully loaded train? Please don't throw good money after bad. Spending precious funds to accommodate an, at best, uncertain passenger train decades from now is foolish. Repairing old infrastructure, building bits and pieces of a non thoroughfare trail, and basically gifting the corridor to a Midwestern freight corporation accomplishes nothing and Thank suppresses you. all other transportation Thank solutions. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Pico. Hi, Kerry Pico, Aptos. Uh, before I get started, I want to point out that the $10.2 million from Proposition 116 bypassed the use of $10 million of the California Coastal Conservancy Fund, and we wouldn't be in this mess today if we have to do passenger traffic. You have my handout, and this is our, the uh, progressive contract by the, the numbers, and, and by that, by contract, uh, the cost of, to the RTC will be roughly $15 million, not counting improvements to the Capitola Trestle and other things like that. Um, Pro Progressive will pay us $3.6 million if everything goes according to the plan, How, and that means we lose at least 11.4 if everything goes according to plan. However, Progressive does not do passenger traffic. In fact, 86% of, by its own admission, 86% had, by the way, I meant to ask, has anybody run this, the contract Don't numbers Don't ask through? questions right okay. now, just your time. Thank so, 86% you. um, of the total revenue going through that contract is passenger service by Progressive. 73% of that is by the, the Bay Area to Santa Cruz. Now, how many people think that somebody's going to take a three to four hour trip to get in a car, drive to a train station, drive to uh, take Caltrains to Deirdon to transfer onto a Capitol exp uh, Corridor Express that doesn't exist, to a Poirot train station that doesn't exist, and then finally onto a progressive thing at a cost of $464 per family of four round trip for a day at the boardwalk. I don't think that's going to happen. So quite honestly, we're going to lose $15 million. We're not going to lose just 11. So that will be your legacy in knowing going into this contract, we're losing money going in and we're not getting anything out. We're going to lose, uh, it, it doesn't benefit the long-term efforts of the, the, the tracks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Mr. Woodside. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Bodarf, and may it please the commission. My name is Stephen Woodside. I'm a part-time resident of Capitola and I love passenger rail. My love for rail stems from the fact that my uh, ancestors from Sweden came to this country, came to California via ship and rail, and regularly came over from Vasona Station to the then resort Camp Capitola, where generations of my family have been living and enjoying the wonderful environment uh, ever since. Um, from a professional point of view, after I finished at UC, um, Santa Cruz in the second graduating class. I went to law school in Berkeley. I, I served uh, 24 years in the Santa Clara County Council's office, the last eight as county council. I worked on all of those rail projects with people like Rod Dearden and Norman Netta and others to create a vast system of bus, light rail, heavy rail, et cetera. I was at the table when Caltran uh, basically took over from the South Southern Pacific and I fully understand the complexities uh, and it's challenging, but I still believe in passenger rail. Um, after leaving Santa Clara, I served uh, three terms as county council in Sonoma and drafted the legislation uh, that created the entity known as SMART. It took um, two efforts at the ballot to raise sales tax, 10 years to go through a process, and the trains are running carrying about 3,000 passengers per day, and that is over the stretch of two counties with a combined population of more than three quarters of a million dollars. And from my experience, I can tell you that two, two important things that you should keep in mind. One, 
you need to have an economic and tax base and population base to support passenger rail. And as far as I can tell, in my lifetime, you won't see that in this county. Sadly, I say that. Secondly, from the point of view of where you are now, you seem to have elevated freight, which costs a lot more. Need uh, to wrap up, Mr. Okay, but freight uh, requires you to upgrade to the freight standard, and it's incompatible with light rail and incompatible with many of the alternatives Thank you, you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kara Dival. I'm a resident of Boulder Beach, and I work at Seascape Resort in Aptos. I'd like to respectfully remind the members of the committee of the responsibility to be conscientious stewards by emphasizing stipulations of the first paragraph. Go ahead and pull that microphone closer. Thank you. Of the final Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Plan's listing of goals, stating that the guiding framework for the developing this plan is to enhance a non-motorized mobility, as well as qualities including improved access and quality of life for Santa Cruz County residents and visitors. By creating a pedestrian corridor, the beauty of the Monterey Bay coastline will be easily and simply accessible to all residents and visitors, regardless of age, ability, or financial situation. With limited implementation, implementation cost shouldered by already burdened county taxpayers. The corridor is wide enough for all types of individual and group of travel, for families, tourists, residents, or athletes, using strollers, bicycles, scooters, rollerblades, or on foot. By adding rail, you make it virtually impossible to keep all traffic on the corridor, negatively infringing on and impacting the peace and safety of adjacent communities. It seems counterproductive and unnecessary to consider rail, which significantly decreases the available pedestrian pathway, critically degrading that experience <coughs> and reducing the volume of individuals possible on the corridor. People on the pedestrian corridor as well as adjacent neighborhoods such as La Selva Beach will have other highly valued peace and quiet disrupted with train noise, stunning natural views blighted, and will cause a lengthy financial burden to the residents of the county and future generations with excessive expense to build, run, and maintain rail as well as cost of tickets and commuter lots. I repeat, by adding rail, you make it virtually impossible to keep all traffic out in the corridor. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Micah Bosner, I'm a cyclist. I have an idea for you. Maybe we should do rail transportation on the rail line. <laughs> I mean, it's an idea, you know. Um, I know when I was really involved in starting the rail trail process, and I'm so glad that we're more or less in agreement about that, I got a call from someone from Seattle who said, hey, let me tell you how you can stop the trains with your trail so that it won't be noisy. And I said, I think trains are a public good. And he said, but you're a cyclist, right? I said, yeah, I'm a cyclist. I'm not gonna take the train that much, but I made a promise to Tony Campos, to other people in the community, that when we get our awesome trail, we're not gonna stop other people from having a great way to get around that doesn't destroy the environment and that gets them out of congestion and is socialized transportation because it doesn't cost a lot of money to go from Watsonville to Santa Cruz or wherever else. And I'm standing by that, even though, really, I, I like riding my bike. So, um, that, so I, I approve you doing this contract with Progressive because the money you spend on upgrading the rails is gonna be money well spent when we get our passenger rail service. There's nothing wrong with spending money to upgrade property that you own so that when you can have a vision that we can have passenger rail service. That's a good use of public money. You know, in my spare time, I sometimes think about the people in the 30s that all the public leaders who idiotically ripped up the rail system in the United States, which was an extremely amazing system, good for the public, good for the environment. And I wonder what they thought. Did they think, it'll be quieter by my house? Did they think, this will be better for my institution? Did they think, you know, but, this, but I'll make more money if people drive cars. What exactly were they thinking when they let the oil and auto industries rip up our rail system in the United States and replaced it with purposely crummy bus system called Greyhound and nothing else. For those people that are interested in BRT, it's interesting, but it's also a Trojan horse for private transportation to continue to run this country and not have what we really need, which is rail service. Please support the recommendations Thank for rail. You. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. There's a little piece on that map that is critical key. Two Pajaro Station stop, 
we do not have a way to get there by bus. Correction, we did have a way that with the bus that went to Pajaro, but Santa Cruz Metro yanked that in their last service revisions of 2018. That Pajaro station is key. I timed it myself December 26th last year. Here is what to expect in terms of travel time. 7.05 p.m. past Watsonville Junction, 8 p.m. past Tamian, 8.06 p.m. arrived at SJC, not the plane one, the train one. Uh, why we don't have a connection at Pajaro already is beyond me. Having to go north to San Jose via Highway 17 in order to go south on the rails is silly, but alas, that is how lots of public transit commutes seem to work. Rail service commuting, commu connecting to Pajaro would make our commute's so much easier. South County could connect to Silicon Valley in one hour. Our entire county could connect as far north as Seattle, as far south as San Diego, and as far east as Chicago, in less than two or three rail seats. Got a lag luggage or a bike? No problem. There will be space for you and your goodies. Uh, the experience of travel is then enhanced. You get to enjoy coastal views, a diner car where you get to meet travelers from across the world, and end up at your final destination and relaxed and without your ears ringing. Um, did I mention that rail travel also effectively halves your carbon emissions versus flying? That sounds like a green way if I ever heard of one. With those new locomotives by Siemens going live on the National Passenger Rail Network, that cut could be even more. For reference, uh, the Amtrak new newest locomotives are offering the latest Tier 4 emissions technologies, uh, reducing nitrogen oxide emissions by 89%, particulate matter by 95%, and 10% uh, fuel savings on top of what is already efficient transit. Having rail service uh, in Santa Cruz County is important. It's time Mid and South County get some effective transit options. Please back the UCIS scenario and emphasize putting more traffic Thank you. on our rail branch line. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Len Bia. I'm I've been a resident of Santa Cruz since 1970. Uh, I'm a member of the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation, and I want to focus my comments on the investment of funds to expand capacity on Highway 1. The EIR states that there would be an almost one-third increase in vehicle miles traveled from the improvements on Highway 1. Those figures, when you dig down, um, they're claiming that there's actually a reduction in emissions along with that almost 30% increase, and those figures are simply not credible. They're based almost entirely on the state's projections of um, vehicle miles per gallon in the future. In other words, we're depending entirely on state standards for achieving a reduction in emissions when we're actually, what we're doing is increasing the amount of dependence on private automobiles without providing enough investment in, in mass transit. Um, so I encourage you to, to remove investment in additional capacity on the highway. Adding bus on shoulder makes sense and is a move in the right direction. Uh, but the investment in an increased capacity on the highway is not sustainable, and that's really the important core value that we have to develop here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Diane Dreyer, and I'm a resident of the county. Um, I'm with Friends of the Rail Trail, and I've been out volunteering. I've walked it to doors talked to people in Capitola during that campaign uh, against Measure L. I have also been at the Aptos Farmers Market um, the last few weeks, and I can tell you that overwhelmingly, we are getting a very positive response to keeping the rail. Um, often I hear, <coughs> why would they do that? Why would they tear out the tracks? So we got, I'd say, you know, about 80 um, cards signed, um, and they, are they were delivered to you. Let's say, let's keep the rail and build the trail as soon as possible. Everybody wants the trail, but they also want to keep our options open, and that's what I want to stress. Um, rail transit is the future, and uh, addressing the climate crisis will cost money in, in all communities. There's no avoiding it. And I really think that st state rail funds will be made available to this county. That's already been explored and contacts have been made with state officials. So we will get millions of dollars, I'm confident of that. Um, 
I really hope that you will think about future generations and keep our options open. Please approve the preferred scenario. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, I'm Robert Stevens, and I know most of you personally, and I really appreciate your effort on this cause, but there's really no reason to select a scenario now. There's a false rush being put forward to lock you into a train contract. Relax and think. Forget the 120 days, the $300,000, and all the fal false pressures that have been created to make this an urgent decision point. Please do the following. Complete Metro's request for a non-modal specific analysis of the corridor. Do a full analysis of the operation and capital funding sources for transit in the corridor. Of course you should do this, duh. This is what I thought we were doing with this UCIS. Why wasn't it included? For the three of you that represent Metro, you cannot support the current plan. The RTC says, except this is a fair and open study of the corridor, yet we have nothing to say except stay the course. Nothing has changed. Now they want to promise an analysis for Metro. And what do you think the outcome will be? Stay the course. You're gonna be throwing Metro under the train, so please don't vote for this. <laughs> and though, and through all the studies, I see the term rail and trail operators. Now the new term is high capacity public transit. What does that mean? I thought we were doing a study to have some clarity on that. S so the study does not meet the guidelines of Measure D. We are talking about a train or a bus in the corridor now. This is a conclusive study. We have no results on this. If it isn't a train in the corridor, you need to rail bank and abandon the corridor. Is this possible? Did the study reveal anything about these two options? No, you didn't want to look at that because everybody wants a train. Your own study on the cost of repairing the freight line is not out till later in the year, yet you want to engage in a contract that's gonna have you put money into a train corridor and you have no idea what the cost is. Thank you for your comment, sir. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Saladin Sale. I'm a 50-year county resident and 18-year e-bike rider. <laughs> I'd like to give you a short break from the deluge of contradictory projections to share a simple vision of the future. Here's what I want, where I want to be in 16 years, which is a short time in terms of major civic projects. There's a 12-foot wide minimum bike and pedestrian trail reaching from Watsonville to Davenport along the rail corridor. There's a supercapacitor electric powered light rail system with abundant bicycle carrying capacity reaching from Watsonville to Davenport that recharges every 30 seconds, or at 30 seconds, every stop without the need for overhead wiring. Timed buses, buses or shuttles, along with shared bicycles and ride shares, meet the train on arrival at every stop, taking riders to destinations like Cabrillo College, Dominican, Sutter, and Kaiser Hospitals, UCSC, and downtown Santa Cruz area. Riders can exit the train on Chestnut Street in Santa Cruz for access to downtown employers and businesses. The downtown line terminates in Harvey West Park at a connection terminal for Highway 17 express buses. Santa Cruz employers provide fare subsidies to workers traveling from South County as a recruiting and retention tool that's more efficient than raising the wage to support transit. Residents and visitors take their bikes and backpacks on our light rail north coastline to beaches and parks north of Santa Cruz, creating jobs at new businesses serving this new visitor population. Highway 1 between Santa Cruz and Watsonville remains congested during commuting hours and weekends, but is used primarily by autos headed out of the county. In-county travel has evolved over time so that most in-county travel occurs via light rail, bicycle, shared vehicles, and walking. Thanks to the RTC for doing the right thing. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Craig Chatterton, South County. Um, I am probably in the minority based on the comments so far, but I can't reconcile the preferred scenario in this process. Uh, and I hope I'm wrong. I'd like to be wrong, but I really am worried about this. And I'm encouraging you to reject the preferred scenario. I don't believe that it adequately addresses the needs of the transportation in the community. Uh, the previous talk person talked about the cost. It's projected to be $900 million plus 
And that's before the overruns and the things will probably dry that up. And that's a, a really heavy cost to pay relative to the benefits we get. In fact, all the scenarios, most of the metrics as, as looked at by the dashboard minimally improve. Some 2%, 5%, 10%, most of them don't really move that much, including peak travel times and speeds. Barely budge. So if you look at it from a quality of life standpoint for the residents in this county, I don't see how many of us will really benefit from that. And we're gonna pay a billion dollars more. That's like $3,450 per person in the county. Now some of that money comes from the state, some of that money comes from the Fed, but if it's more than a billion dollars, let's say over $2 billion, that increase is gonna come out of this county. There's not gonna be additional funding from other places to supplement that. So I, I can't reconcile this and, and come up with a cost-benefit analysis that makes sense for me. And that's why I, I would urge you to vote against this. And ironically, there's many things in the scenarios, all scenarios, that make a lot of sense. You look at them and you say, well, the, most of the savings in terms of like collisions and accidents comes from things that are across the board, incre increased uh, uh, enforcement and education. We should have done those two years ago, shame on us. If those are good things to do, why aren't they already in place? And they're independent of the scenarios requiring these billions of dollars. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Hello, my name is Nancy Connolly. I'm from Santa Cruz. And um, I don't have something written today because honestly, this issue exhausts me. I've been working on it for over five years. And um, I think what I've seen in working toward, well, first of all, I'll say for any of you who understands the symbolism of my shirt, you'll understand where I'm going. And I applaud you. Um, if you don't, I'm against the scenario that's being proposed. I dissent. Um, I think the current plan is unrealistic. I've lived in Europe for over a decade. I love trains where it's appropriate and where it's affordable. I don't feel our community can support a train. I don't think our community can afford a train. I've been a bike commuter for years, 20 years in this <laughs> county. I've been hit twice. Um, and so I'm discouraged. I've become a cynic from what I've seen from the RTC staff, commissioners, contractors hired. And so um, I don't think I'm gonna add anything that you haven't already heard. There's a lot of stats out there. There's a lot of scenarios. There's been a lot of work done. So I'm just gonna leave it at that, that I am um, disappointed if you will move forward with this because I think it will do a disservice to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Now I am here on behalf of someone else. Do I have to get to the back to the line? Someone who's unable to attend? Yeah, they, they have to be here to, to come to the podium. Yeah, we can't have someone on, to get in the line and come to, go through the process. I can get in line for them? No, 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 only the person who's here can get in line and come through the process. Thank you. Thank you. Step forward, ma'am. Thank you. Chair and Commissioners, my name's Gillian Greensite and I'm here representing the Sierra Club. You received our letter and we'll note that we did not recommend a particular scenario, but instead recommended a set of principles which we feel very important for you to consider as you choose or recommend or vote on a scenario. In the interest of time, I'll just read um, uh, the uh, highlights from our letter. And uh, starting with that the Sierra Club transportation policy states that transportation strategies must protect natural systems and open space, reduce vehicle miles traveled, and promote environmental and economic justice and access for all. <coughs> In crafting the preferred scenarios, the RTC should prioritize transit and acti active transportation by eliminating auto-centric projects, retaining transit and a trail on the rail corridor, designing all projects to enhance pedestrian and bicycle safety and comfort, and aiming to reduce existing VMT, vehicle miles traveled, 
rather than generating new excursion or growth opportunities. We note that higher property values should be considered an undesirable byproduct, not a goal of transit improvements. Specifically, the Sierra Club supports efforts to attract and enable new developments only if these efforts focus on truly affordable housing. Furthermore, we ask the RTC to consider a number of factors um, and assess impacts and finally, I see time's gone, uh, we, I would end with that the public ownership of the existing rail corridor must not be put at risk nor subject to expensive, lengthy property rights litigation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Hi, Bill Smallman, uh, Felton. Uh, I have a separate compelling reason why to move forward with removing the tracks and installing the trail only, which I had been advocating. It would be extremely cost effective to remove the rail tracks and install underground utility pipelines, in particular large diameter pipelines that distribute recycled water. The Soquel Creek Water District is going to spend $90 million on a cost ineffective plan installing small diameter pipelines in city streets using only 15% of the water, which is currently carrying thousands of tons of pollutants out into the bay. Restoration, traffic control, cross lines, engineering, and all the other obstacles in city streets is over 60% of the cost to un install underground pipelines and conduits. I know I've been estimating such projects for th over 30 years. Um, preferred options are not found by hiring biased consultants. They're found by putting this decision to a vote. So Cal Creek Water District can install larger diameter pipelines for a third of the cost in the corridor. Difference is now the other agencies can now tap into the remaining 85% of this water. This project will cost tens of millions of dollars less than the current plan. All the money saved just allowing the installation of underground utilities and rail corridor will pay for the restoration of a bike path that the Greenway and Trail now envision. In my opinion, by your actions, you are promoting a complete boondoggle. And I do not believe that this is a legacy that you want to leave. It's been proven over and over that not enough people will ride this cost exorbitant train. The electric bicycles in the city have been a resounding success, and all this new spectacular innovations using the latest technology are gonna set the worst president in the history books if you keep promoting this ineffective, outdated, archaic train. The solution to, to the water problem is real. The threat of salt water intrusion would be eliminated and we would have a world-class state-of-the-art bike pack that would put your stamp on the... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good morning, commissioners. My name is David Date, former developer of the um, LSBIA, director develop, de development director of the LSBIA. I, um, I've spoken ad nauseum about the effects that the current traffic crisis has had on Southern <coughs> County residents. We've taken our daughter out of school. I work fewer hours and it is, it is unbearable. We passed Measure D two years ago. We purchased our corridor six years ago and now we are signing a 10 year lease with a freight company that promises to run excursion so we can um, maintain our corridor, we're not talking about solutions. We're talking about prolonging the congestion. And I think the 800 pound gorilla in the room um, was outlined recently in a Good Times article and then even prior to that in a um, Good Times article with uh, Mesty Miller and he talks about transit oriented development tells us what we need our housing units along our corridor. And this, this idea of upzoning, so that we create a transit corridor and then that enables us to create high density development on that. So we're, 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 not, we're, we're, we're talking about something much bigger than a train or a trail. We're talking about the future character of Santa Cruz County. And I don't think people have been very uh, forthcoming with that, with that, that issue. That this is more of a, a gateway, a gateway vote into a much larger, um, a much larger uh, scenario that will impact uh, Santa Cruz County. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. I guess it is afternoon. Nope. <laughs> Hi. My name is Teeny Andrietta. And uh, firstly, I live right across the street from the rail. Uh, 
I strongly advocate for keeping the rail line. We have it in place. Um, it's the last open corridor in the county versus Highway 1. Um, I feel that every day we delay costs us more money and I'm really worried about also people and kids that are on the road. If we don't have a separate corridor with the, with the trail where kids can ride their bike and where we, uh, and then at a later date soon that we put in a light, a state of the art, high rail that will serve the whole county. I'm down in Aptos and everyone I've talked to that lives down in South County in Watsonville, I haven't met one person who does not support keeping the rail line in place. Um, I also feel, because it's an in inequity, I um, feel that, again, every day is uh, a delay. And then lastly, I've taken numerous times from Oxford, California to downtown LA. They have a great rail line, and um, people bring their wheelchairs, strollers, bicycles into the first third of the, uh, of the ra light rail it's quiet, then um, uh, I, I think it's fantastic. Do not, please do not rip up the rail line. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lori Negro. I am a fourth generation Santa Cruz native and the owner of Betty Burgers. I have three locations in Santa Cruz and a fourth opening in Aptos. I also own the building on the corner of Trout Gulch and Soquel where the railroad tracks have an easement through my property. It was, um, when I look at the size of the easement granted, I see no room for a trail. Maybe I'm missing something. I also own property on 505 Seabright Avenue with a crossroad of Murray. When the Christmas train ran a few years ago, working and dining at the location became almost intolerable with the blaring horns at the intersection. <laughs> Hiring and retaining employees in Santa Cruz, as we all know, has become extremely difficult. Not just for me, it's across the board. The idea of loud, busy trains rolling through, freight trains rolling through the neighborhood will make it far worse. Having said that, I believe a world-class trail would be an asset to all. Obviously, as a business owner along the rail corridor, I have a vested interest. My understanding is that the Santa Cruz, Regional Trans Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission has owned the rail corridor for eight years. You would think they would be talking to property owners, businesses, especially since properties such as mine have the tracks on them. I have never heard from this organization, who is really my neighbor. It is difficult to understand how this organization can make long-term transportation investment plans without communicating with their neighbors. Signing a long-term contract with an out-of-town railroad company is not in the best interest of our community. I ask that you not approve the proposed train plan today, but ask RTC staff to reach out to its neighbors further, or reach out. Find a solution that works for all. I'm certainly willing to help. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Welcome, Mr. Garrett. Thank you, I'm Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz. Um, I, I, I strongly support doing the alternatives analysis that Metro has requested, and I do strongly request that the analysis should include emerging technologies such as personal rapid transit. I really appreciate the staff for expanding the recommendation to a more generalized high capacity transit. Um, the phrase high capacity, I just want to emphasize at least my definition, it needs to be a high capacity system. It doesn't mean each vehicle needs to be high capacity. We need high capacity in people per hour, which is not the same as a lot of people per vehicle. Um, I do want to suggest a couple of amendments to the proposed resolution and scenario. Um, item 10 of the resolution authorizes the executive director to ex execute a license for Progressive Rail to run excursion trains. I believe this goes well beyond what phase two requires. Um, I don't think excursion trains should be authorized until after the comprehensive alternatives analysis is done. It may be premature and dangerous to authorize the excursion trains because the contract basically says if the excursion train is successful, we won't have an option to run other forms of transit alongside or above the tracks. Let's keep our options open to run a personal rapid transit system above the rail corridor. The PRT can coexist with railroad tracks and freight. Um, my other suggestion for amending the scenario goes with the 
uh, recommendation from the Campaign for Sensible uh, sustainable transportation to remove the provisions for auxiliary lanes and HOV lanes. I do support bus on shoulder. I think it can be done with minimal construction. It does not require the auxiliary lanes. I support the CFST in their recommendation to not build the auxiliary lanes and HOV lanes. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Fred Geiger. Uh, just a quick reminder, there's been some public uh, process regarding people's personal interests that I think is inappropriate here. You're here to represent the public good, not a few people's quibble about trains in their backyard. If that doesn't work for them, they're welcome to move, I think. I uh, wanted to recognize uh, Commissioner Rodkin's concern, PRT not being specifically mentioned here. Uh, just like ripping out rails, failing to recognize something that could be useful in the future would be very short-sighted and counterproductive. When I was born, Los Angeles was tearing out rails. Now they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars putting them back in. And you know, what's the problem? The rails seem compatible with bike trails, pedestrian, and other uses. And going back to PRT, a crucial link could be established between a train, let's say, by the boardwalk parking lot and the metro center that would increase metro use and increase train use and be very small segment, but a train that doesn't go anywhere people want to go really doesn't have much use and you won't get much ridership. So the PRT link could increase ridership, metro feeding the train, and from any uh, stop on the rail, which would probably be the boardwalk, down to the uh, metro center. This would be a, a pretty economical way to increase the feasibility of the rail much sooner than if there was not such a link. So I'm just asking you, you know, I'd ask you to build it tomorrow, but let's be realistic, don't preclude it ever being built at least by not mentioning it in your report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Pia Cannon from Ecology Action. Ecology Action supports the staff draft um, preferred scenario, um, but with the caveat that um, beyond the Measure D approved auxiliary lanes, um, we, don't, we don't support um, Highway 1 projects um, that increase capacity, car vehicle capacity um, beyond public transit, which we do support on the highway. Um, so, and then I did, I wanted to also state um, two specific things. So one, one request is in the resolution, um, as it's worded now, when they talk about um, bike lanes um, improvements on the SoCal Freedom Corridor, I believe it's, set, it's the wording is stated as buffeted versus um, protected. And I would ask that um, language be inserted that clearly states along this corridor that protected bike lanes are preferred over buffeted realizing that the full length of the corridor, you can't have protected bike lanes, but to prioritize those and clearly state that in the resolution and anywhere else in the um, UCS to state that, that would, that would be um, great. And then also the second thing, um, you know, Commissioner Rockin brought up earlier um, about programs. Programs can be implemented tomorrow. They can help the RTC staff and partners can work with residents and work sites to make sure that what we have, we can better utilize to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and um, gasoline-fueled drive-alone trips to reduce those, those, those types of trips in Santa Cruz. So I would ask that, that those, pr those programs be better prioritized in the language. So if there's a way to insert text to say, you know, the RTC staff will work, they're called transportation demand management programs, that those be prioritized as something that can, that can be done tomorrow. So a lot of these projects are gonna take years to implement um, and if we can prioritize some of those um, programs, I'd appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, Ms. Strauss. Good morning. My name is Yannicka Strauss. I'm the Executive Director of Bike Santa Cruz County. Today, you have the opportunity to support sustainable progress. Bicycling can provide the solution that we all seek, a healthy and clean form of transportation for all. Your decision today has the potential to give the green light to construct the rail trail, and what Mr. Preston says could take as little as 10 years. Please support keeping the tracks so that we can build the rail trail as soon as possible. The rail trail is not the only important project in the UCS. Protected bike lanes on the SoCal Freedom Corridor have the potential to drastically reduce safety hazards and exponentially increase ridership because they provide a physically separated facility on a major cross-county route. Please update the resolution language to include protected and buffered bike lanes on the SoCal Freedom Corridor. 
Lastly, Bike Santa Cruz County feels the evidence for passenger rail in our county is significant and we support continuing to consider passenger rail service options. Please adopt the staff recommendation and thank you for your dedication and commitment to our community and thank you for your continued support of safe and comfortable bicycling in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, my name is Ed Porter and I'm the president of Santa Cruz PRT. We brought you a couple weeks ago in an electronic form this brochure about ATN, personal rapid transit and automated transit networks and another paper copy today, uh, which I hope you all received. Um, I was made slightly nervous by kind of a, a key comment by staff as we started this item, and that was the shovel ready reference which I think started with President Obama. And I would like to think maybe that was the area when that was the key consideration because Shovel Ready kind of excludes what I'm here to talk to you about today, and that is uh, elevated solar-powered PRT ATM. Uh, and I'd really like to see a fresh and believable commitment from our RTC uh, to reducing our transportation CO2 emissions. That's in the pie chart of all the CO2 emissions, the biggest slice and something that we can really get at right now, whereas many of the others we can't do as much about, but we can take a big chunk out of it with this kind of transportation. And when you opened the meeting with those young ladies from Sweden, I wondered why, why did they come to Santa Cruz and why are they telling this group about that subject and saying that it's something that should be a top priority. Uh, is there a climate mandate for us on the RTC? I'm not sure, but are we willing to forget about carbon emissions or, are we willing to, or do we wanna do something about them? Are we willing to forget about safety and the 30 to 40,000 people killed on highways every year in the United States or the 8,000 people killed on so-called light rail every year in the United States? I think we should have those in our top priorities. And with PRT, the record is it's 100% safe, unheard of. That's the light rail that we need. Thank you, sir. Oh, hello. Hi, Karina McFarlane, Live Oak, good morning. Um, I've, despite my accent, I've lived in Santa Cruz for 20 years and in the States nearly 30. I benefited from training with the Santa Cruz Probation Department in restorative justice to keep first-time offenders out of the criminal system. So I'm very interested in models that help get us to a place better than we are today each time. And you know now I've submitted before the deadline and it's in the public record that we did actually go through a randomly select citizens from all points of the county and take them through this dynamic facilitation. And the most profound thing for me that I want to share is that I've never been in a civic discourse where I was silent for 11 hours. I was a silent witness. So all of us who are training to do this dynamic facilitation did not say a word. And we watched these seven citizens come in and say, well, the train would be nice, and, but I, you know, I read this and I read that, and well, I don't know who the bad guys are, and um, some of the, somebody's got to be the bad guy, and, but wouldn't that be nice, and wouldn't this be nice? And, and, and in the room, it just shifted and shifted and shifted until they had this, wow, we have this incredible opportunity, the coastal corridor, and it could be rebranded, and it could be like the Jack O'Neill wetsuit of before and the one-wheel skateboard, like the whole of the country could be looking. Look what Santa Cruz did with the, the coastal corridor. They did arrive at that they would like to see it rail banked, and they would like to see it be the most phenomenal, beyond what anyone's seen or been, in multimodality transport tra transit corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Shellhammer. The preferred scenario before you now accomplishes two important things. First, it puts the trail only concept behind us, allowing trail construction to proceed consistent with the award winning trail master plan you previously adopted. This is important because this year is shaping up as the year of trail construction and we need to get on with that construction without further interruption. And second, 
it moves us forward toward having a real rail transit proposal to consider, one with equipment and frequency and stations specified, one with, um, so that we can uh, look at specific costs and benefits. Up to now, the rail transit debate has been a war of hypotheticals and fear mongers. With a real CIR, with a real CEQA EIR uh, out in public, we will see for the first time exactly what is being proposed and what the consequences would be. This will get us to a more informed, more substantive, and less emotional discussion, exactly where we need to be. There are two cautions uh, as to how you should proceed from here. First, you need to keep the tracks on this right away. What you put on those tracks is a different question, but you need the tracks for two reasons. You need tracks as a necessary part of not having to ship 15 million local dollars back to Sacramento. And you need tracks to fully protect the, continu the continuity of the right of way and your ownership of it. Rail property easements are a miserably complicated subject and there is more than one way to end up with only bits and pieces of a right of way that do no one any good. And second, you need to make sure that the uh, process of deciding between BRT and transit does not, does not metastasize into two full Thank you, sir. Uh, alternative analysis. With those cautions, I urge you to support Thank you. the preferred scenario. Hi, my name is Jessica Evans, and I live in Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so you know that I support from past comments that I support um, preserving the rail easement um, for future use in mass transportation. I think potentially there could even be some freight shipping into North County at some point, um, which would save a lot of CO2 emissions because freight transport is safer and um, more um, efficient than truck freight. Um, but I'm really here speaking at this moment because I'm, I'm actually very concerned that the overall uh, Unified Corridor study came back and made a recommendation that doesn't seem to focus on reducing vehicle miles traveled. Um, I feel like having, I don't quite understand what happened between scenario B and scenario preferred scenario, which sort of shovels in a huge amount of freeway widening, possibly just so that everyone will feel like they got a piece of the pie. There's no actual freeway widening potential before 2035, so how would congestion be a thing that got relieved before 2035. There's no funding for anything before 3025, so congestion relief wouldn't happen before 2035. And add to that, you know, all congestion relief on freeways is temporary. So what would we be buying by putting millions and millions of dollars into, you know, if we could get them? I just don't understand it. Like, how does it make sense to widen the freeway, increase vehicle miles traveled, the plan to increase vehicle miles traveled, plan to increase greenhouse gas emissions relative to baseline that we get from, you know, having higher fuel standards. We don't have any actual source of funding for this. Like, why do we have that in the Unified Quarter Study? Thank you. Thank you. There, I had a slide. And it says one minute for some reason. I'm hoping I get two. Uh, Manu Koenig, Santa Cruz County Greenway. Good morning, honorable commissioners. Um, I'm urging you to vote no on the preferred scenario and approving the UCI UCS today because it does not include the necessary economic and environmental analysis that was promised in Measure D. Uh, you can see here a, a quote from the Measure D voter approved expenditure plan that promises those two things before we move forward with the corridor. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the UCS lacks uh, both environmental and economic analysis. In terms of e economic analysis, there's not a cost-benefit analysis. The performance measures that were mentioned look only at benefits, but not at costs. And in fact, when you divide the benefits of the preferred scenario by the cost, it becomes anything but the preferred scenario. Um, second, you don't look at the most critical economic uh, 
piece of analysis, which is the cost per trip. And when you use the numbers from the Unified Corridor Study, and again, divide the number of users by the cost, you can see that bike and pedestrian infrastructure does, outperforms all the others hands down. Maybe that's why communities all over the country, indeed all over the world, are investing so heavily in trail infrastructure. And let's make no mistake, this will reduce traffic on the highway. As any of you who were driving last week noticed, there was an eerie calm on Friday evening as you went south, and that was because schools were out. And so the trail will allow North County families to get off the roads and onto the trail so that South County breadwinners can get to work. And what's, uh, you can see here is that rail doesn't make any sense and the thousand signatures that we collected on the Greenway petition stated not only that people wanted a trail but that they don't think a train makes economic sense and I think you have the wisdom of the crowds evident here and so I'm worried that if we try to build the trail around the rail line we are putting our best idea hostage to our worst idea Hold it. and you, hold you know it. the other part is you haven't done the environmental analysis that was promised in Measure D, you're about to commit $15 million to fix up the rail without the environmental or economic analysis Thank you, promised. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to all of us, and thank you for being, will being willing to sit in your chairs of decision-making responsibility. I I'm Jack Nelson. I'm a retired environmental planner and land use planner. Uh, I'm a member of the Campaign for Sensible Transportation. I'm also the chair of the Sierra Club's Transportation Committee. I appreciate uh, Jillian already sharing some of the Sierra Club's letter with you uh, the, this morning. Um, w within the preferred scenario, I'd like to zero in on one component, which is uh, widening of Highway 1. And uh, we've got a new document that was just released January 3rd. I'm holding volume one of three main volumes before me. It's the Highway 1 final EIR. And it's, it's been curious to me that in the past three years, your commission has never had a study session on the draft EIR. And I'm not sure how far you've cracked open this final EIR. But here, here's one heart-stopping um, item from within this first volume. Table 3-1 shows that with the HOV lanes preferred alternative, that uh, vehicle miles traveled would increase at 2035 by 103 million vehicle miles per year. Uh, this can only be a recipe for climate catastrophe. Uh, yes, you can get consultants who will torture the numbers sufficiently so that they confess that there's going to be this Goldilocks world where traffic's going to flow at fuel efficient speeds and greenhouse gases, despite all those vehicle miles, will magically go down. I don't believe it. Um, so, and I'm also appreciating Gail McNulty. Uh, bringing in the uh, Swedish 15-year-old girl to talk to you this morning. Uh, she's, she's right. Uh, you know, I've heard from some of you that you feel it's not politically feasible to do the right thing, but it's your obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. Michael Saint, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I've changed my presentation four times over the last 45 minutes, so <laughs> I'll get to it, try not to repeat things. Um, campaign for Sustainable Transportation does not support the preferred scenario in Northern 2035, and primarily from what people have said, it's very car eccentric. And after hearing um, Ginger Dicar present this morning, I understand the city of Santa Cruz would like more <coughs> car eccentric uh, performance. They want to move to the additional lanes over the bridge uh, San Lorenzo River, also the Miss Mission Street intersection improvements, and they even mentioned Soquel as more improvements. So that moves three more car projects over to the scenario, possibly. Um, out of the 11 boxes that would be filled at that time, five of them are automobile oriented, and that's for our since sensible or sustainable transportation people, that's way, way over the board. Uh, we basically had supported B without any car uh, involvement at all. So that's where we are at this present time. I also want to go back to 2003 and 4 uh, when they were doing a study similar to this. There was a comment made that uh, to keep congestion from exceeding 15 percent, 
Metro would have to increase to 8.5% of carrying capacity for the, tr for the county. And we're not even close to that. Actually, the latest numbers I could get off the RTC website from 2011 and 12, cars are doing 85%, which is the heavy load, walking 10%, transit was as low as 1.8 to 3%, and then they also had biking at around 3.2%. So we haven't done anything. And I think this scenario does not do much for transit. You do have a bus on shoulders, but I believe that's in combination with cars on the ox lanes. Um, the time, oh, are, am I done? Thank you. Oh, that was quick. It was. I had some really important stuff coming up. I think they moved it faster on you, Mike. This Brian Trail now only. Um, I want to remind you, mass transit isn't necessarily public transit. The study showed actually trail only had the most users, five times what a train had, five times what a bus had. So you actually have to keep that in that your additional from an engineer's perspective, your, your study. If you're gonna put PRT in there, you have to include using it as a trail. So we asked that. Secondly, Davenport to Wilder. That's not part of the study. Can we accept that you're not gonna have a train running up to Davenport from Wilder? So we're asking you, and this come from the farmers, from the farmers, that you do not include that as part of the giveaway to progressive rail. End it at Wilder, because that will ensure that we move forward with a trail, because you are, will likely lose the $10 million grant because of the delays if we have to go to court and fight. We don't want that, and that's gonna happen if you have a train. You don't need the train. Please pull that as part of the progressive. The other thing I want to encourage is take a moment back and call CTC staff. I've been talking to them. There's a lot of misconceptions of what's going on in the way of Proposition 116 funds being returned. Um, you, you have the opportunity, you should have your staff go talk to them and find out the, the true requirements. They are actually surprised that you're not gonna go and ask for funding from SB1 and Self Health County with that new tier one um, completion on Highway 1. You are in a great position to get SB1 self-help county to widen Highway 1. And to throw the train as the priority now, that's confusing to them. Don't go and send the wrong message to them, please. You need to go and talk to CTC staff before you approve this. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hi, I'm Stephen Slade, Executive Director of the Land Trust. Um, we only have an opinion on one aspect of this study, which is the trail. Uh, and we have an opinion on it because we committed $5 million of matching funds. We're your funding partner. And uh, so far, we've only raised three and a half million. And honestly, you cannot raise money for a project until this commission settles the issue of are we building the rail trail according to the master plan or, or not. So I urge you to make a, a decision. And uh, I know it's confusing because we just heard from someone used to be trail now advocating for trail delay. And of course the real issue here is the train, not the trail. We only care about the trail and building it as soon as possible. You have the plan. We are willing to provide matching funds. Let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, my name is Bill Spence. I live in La Silva Beach. The La Silva Beach Improvement Association voted overwhelmingly in two th October of 2017 to oppose rail in the corridor. If the commission votes to move ahead with phase two, that commits the county to rebuild rail on the corridor. That is in direct opposition to the desires of the residents of La Silva Beach. Further, the rail right of way at La Silva is one of the narrowest in the county. The scenic trail master plan states that the right of way is between 40 and 60 feet in this segment. A physical measurement with a tape measure uh, shows that it's less than 30 feet. That 10 feet is critical. Based on the details of the same plan, a 30 foot right of way would only support an eight foot path. Is that acceptable? The path is 12 feet everywhere else within the plan. By forcing rail onto the corridor, higher, uh, what I hear, alternative higher density transportation such as carts and bikes um, that could leverage the corridor are going to be limited in our choices by that choke point. 
But what if the commission decides later that an eight foot path is too narrow after putting rail in the, uh, in the corridor? What will the commission do then? Will people on bikes be forced off the corridor at Manresa onto busy surface streets like San Andreas to get around the problem? Just like Capitola, La Silva Beach could not support the influx of people and traffic on our streets. The corridor traffic must stay in the corridor through La Silva Beach as promised in the scenic trail master plan. Otherwise, it will destroy the fabric of our community. The trestle of Silva has a similar physical problem. If the rail is not required, the trestle could easily be converted to carry people and bikes over the drainage and stay in the corridor. The rail on the corridor, rail on the corridor requires a completely new structure for people and bikes to be built on the inland side of the trestle. But where does it go? <coughs> Having corridor traffic pushed on La Silva's streets and down into the drainage is not an option, even if that's temporary. Again, the mass of people in traffic will completely disrupt our community and way of life. Thank you, sir. Please keep people on the trail. Ryan Sarnataro, Live Oak. Um, one of the most disturbing and annoying parts of this debate is the fake news that you can have a trail and the train. I'm sorry, it doesn't fit. You got one or the other. Uh, assertions by organizations that are supported by the RTC at the uh, groundbreaking uh, the other day. That, oh, we're getting the trail now. No, you're not getting the trail now. You're getting a path. And that path is inadequate for the transportation needs of this county. It's inadequate for a vision of the future. Really, you, the, the fact that we've got to this point here and people are still saying, oh, you can have the rail and the trail. Where, where are the facts in this? We do need to, to come, if we don't have a common set of facts, we're not gonna be able to make a reasonable decision. And it seems to me that there's enough people on this commission who are laboring under this misconception that we can still have both. We, at some point, it'll be proven that we can't have both. And if that's 30 years in the future, or that's now, it seems to me it would be much better for the decision to be made now to take those rails out and exploit the opportunity that we have to turn the Santa Cruz rail corridor into a world-class destination and a world-class personal transportation system, personal transportation infrastructure that will move more people than you could possibly imagine will ever sit on a train subsidized by taxpayers un unhappy with their increased property taxes, sales taxes, and other bills. So please, reconsider. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Johanna Lighthill and I live in Amtos. Um, I I've spoken before and I addressed you about the UCS and how I found that it was, um, I, I cited specific inconsistencies on tables and what have you today, I don't wanna talk about that. I understand it's a broad scope. It focuses on the corridors, just true to its name. Focuses on uh, transportation between Watsonville, Santa Cruz and and uh, not much in between. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. They brought, um, the study is a compilation of a lot of other studies. And uh, I went on the RTC website and found some of the studies they drew upon. And one was the household, California Household Travel Survey of 2012. And they used these tables, but they didn't use the center table. And I urge you to go look. And what, what specifically it says is in Santa Cruz County, the trip lengths, two miles or less, are 40% of all trips. So that means people are not going very far. And of course, they do use the, the highway and they will use the corridor. But 65% um, of all trips are five miles or less. And I hope that you will consider that too. Where I live, I live within walking distance of a shopping center if I were to be able to access the trail. Um, if there's rail and trail, there will be a huge fence uh, that separates me from the trail. I will have to walk a half a mile out of the way and then a half a mile back, then the half a mile to the shopping center I urge you to look at other people like me in communities. How will this 
the projects affect people individually and how might they use inside their communities rather than from point A to point B. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Commissioners, uh, my name is Gray Jamison. I live in Live Oak. Uh, I'm a high school senior and I took the morning off of school to be here today. Um, I'd like to speak to you about um, the Unified Quarter Study because that's what we're all here for. Um, so the first thing that I have a big problem with about trail only is the weather today. It's very rainy. And I don't know how so many people got here. I got here by driving a car because I had no other way that was feasible. Um, and I don't think that people will be riding bikes in this weather. I could barely see driving with the windshield wipers at full blast, so I don't think that biking in this weather is at all safe, even on a protected trail. Um, and public transit is a much better option than that. <laughs> Secondly, um, I work at the boardwalk, and I live uh, within a 15-minute walk of the 41st Avenue rail junction that could be a station, and I would ride that every day that I would have work. Um, and I hear from many of my colleagues at the boardwalk that they would do the same, and many of them live in Watsonville and complain constantly about the traffic situation that our county is facing. Um, I would also like to talk about um, the fact that, hmm. oof, okay. I Take your time, it. you're doing good. Sure, okay. Um, We need transportation options. Our county is barely holding on with its bus system, like um, Alex Clifford said. I try to take the bus as much as I can. I don't own a car, I don't plan to, and um, biking in this county is difficult. We support biking, and we have fairly good bike infrastructure in many places, but we don't have enough, and we need to support that, and we need a trail right now. I was there at the groundbreaking, and it was wonderful, and I cannot wait to be able to ride my bike over that new bridge because when I don't take public transit to get to work, I bike. And that bridge is the connection to my work. Thank you. Thanks for coming up. Good afternoon, Keith Otto. At the last meeting, I said we all have another think coming. Let's think carefully before decisions are made. At the June meeting, discussion among commissioners included the will of the people being mentioned multiple times. And if or when phase two is affirmed, there's no mechanism for the RTC to exit the contract. No exit, this item alone should give us pause. At the December meeting, commissioner staff, the director described the preferred scenario as a list of potential projects that might be considered, not a commitment to any particular project. The item before you today is very different. Let's be very clear. The grant of a phase two license very much commits to the use of trains in the rail corridor. For one, it requires the RTC to repair the tracks from Buena Vista to uh, Davenport. Investments in rail train services are too costly to implement are too costly to maintain, that maintenance being a forever liability. I support freight services in Watsonville, increased investment in SC Metro, increased investment in Highway 1, including HOV lanes to enable express bus service and promote ride sharing. Many agree with my view, but not everybody does. So let's vote to clearly determine the will of the people. This will either confirm or correct the RTC direction. At some point, the, commissioner, the commission is gonna ask taxpayers for more funds. You need overwhelming support. You need to get this right. Let's vote. Vote no on the item today. Vote no on future investments in rail until the will of the people can be determined. Thank you for your consideration in these very important Thank matters. you. Good morning, Chris Schneider, <coughs> Director of Public Works, City of Santa Cruz, and I want to thank Ginger for bringing up the council action on December 11th. Um, I wanted to emphasize a couple of things. Our projects that we are talking about are in the Regional Transportation Plan. It's important for the city that this, the UCIS, doesn't preclude us from asking for federal and state funding for those projects in the future, and that's the primary point of that. I want to emphasize multimodal. We do multimodal improvements at intersections. 
it's for everyone's use. We wanna make sure transit can get through, emergency services, goods and services are delivered, and bike and pedestrian safety. A project at a, an intersection where we add a protected left turn lane, who benefits from that? Clearly it's better access, it's better safety. But bikes and pedestrians on the parallel corridor, their safety is what's really improved with that. It improves, it's amazing how much improves for bikes and pedestrians. We wanna make sure we're able to include the totality of the project funded under any program, and that's the important part. Again, it serves everyone, transit, emergency services, goods and services, bikes, pedestrians, yes, and cars. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Ashley Wynn from La Salva Beach. Uh, I'm not gonna belabor points I've made in the past. Um, I do wanna point out, I wanna raise a question that I would like to see addressed here, and that is, if the commission adopts the preferred scenario, does that foreclose the possibility of having hove lanes uh, sought, sought after prior to 2035? The report of the staff clearly shows that the transit times with Hove lanes is 32 minutes. The transit time with bus on shoulders is 40. And rail transit is 41. Clearly, Hove lanes are the superior option and the only way we get to a preferred solution in terms of people's lifestyles and quality of life. Obviously, Hove Lane should require electric vehicles in the future to address climate change issues. I, I heard the Watsonville City Council debate this. They were very concerned about adding Hove Lanes, um, and that's the only thing that's really gonna help. So my question to you as a board is, will adopting this preclude Hove Lanes prior to 2035 or preclude the staff from seeking hove lanes prior to 2035. If it does, I urge you to reject it. Um, and I thank the Metro for imposing um, a, a, an important issue and that is whether environmental um, um, uh, electric buses, small electric buses on the rail uh, corridor makes more sense than the lunacy, the economic lunacy of a train on tracks on us that sit on a cliff that won't be there in 60 years. Thank you, sir. Hello, Peter Stanger again. Um, I just uh, wanted to put my two bits in and ask that you not uh, accept the uh, preferred scenario for the UCIS. I really very much want to see transportation in our county improved as a South County resident. Um, I would like to see, be able to get on a bus and get up to Santa Cruz without having to fight the traffic. Yeah, I own two cars, but yeah, I also prefer bicycling. <coughs> I would like to see our bicycle infrastructure made safe. I mean, we're leading the state in deaths with bicyclists and injuries with bicyclists. There's nothing to be proud about. And if we embark on the train scenario as being put out here today, most of the money is gonna be going right away to improving those tracks and so we can get our ducks in a row and start moving ahead with a rail. That's really not what we need right now. What we need is transportation. What we need is, base, is safe bicycling, and I urge you to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Scott, Aptos. Sorry I'm late. What did I miss? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, in, you know, I want to thank uh, the commissioners. The, this is a, such a... A, 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 the process is, is the kind of thing that if we had young voters following it, they might, might get discouraged from voting, but it takes a lot of, 
It does, it takes a lot of homework and a lot of research and a lot of work on all of your parts to, to make a decision on something so huge. And that's why we have studies and that's why we have a process. How many studies have we had? And at a certain point you have to have faith in that process. I have faith in that process. I've been waiting for, for years for something to come out and I've, I, I suspected that rail, you know, a rail line that's been there 143 years already, for goodness sake, uh, and, and the success of rail around the world, and we already have a rail line, I was pretty sure that the studies would conclude that this is what we need to do. Uh, that doesn't make it easy to do, though. It's an expensive thing, and there's, it's an unpopular thing to some people. So, you know, what do you do? But, but be careful. You know, Bill Monning came to a small group, and he spoke about votes that he had, and he said, you know, the one thing I never did was, was vote to uh, make sure that I would be reelected. So I always had to vote for the right thing. That's what he said. I believe that. Can't be always easy to do. It can't always be the popular thing to vote for the right thing to do. And I'll say this because I know there's a big call for it. Let's put it to the public to a vote. Ask yourself, what would have happened during the, the civil rights era if school, for, school for, for you know equal education for everyone had been put to the to the popular vote, don't 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 plan that way. Follow the process. You have consultants. You have planners. You have the rest of the world to look at for the success of rail transit. I I hope that you'll vote yes on the resolution. I hope that you'll give Progressive Rail Phase Two. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, and thank you again for <coughs> your attention and receptiveness. I just wanted to just put uh, my voice behind uh, the f global warming. You know, that, uh, scientists around the world agree that this is the biggest issue. You hear about it all day. I'm sure you think about, I hope you think about it all, all, all day too. We have to get people out of cars. It's that, that's a fundamental issue. And there's gonna be resistance, of course. And we all know this, and you're hearing a lot of it today. From what, I can, from what I can tell, not just from today, but from reading the papers and talking to people, a lot of it is natural fear of change, and that's completely understandable. And then a big chunk of it, too, is protecting interests, and I've heard that today uh, at times. And I, I urge you to resist um, those two sources of resistance because they're based on fear and greed. If we were gonna do what's right, and we know what's right is to get people out of cars. We have to have an alternative. And I'm open to anything, anything. But this does seem like the best one. We have the land, we have tracks. The technology is old, but the science isn't. Putting a large vehicle that can house a number of people and bicycles and a lot of things in it on smooth metal, physics is, is in favor of this idea there are other ideas out there, and I welcome them. I've heard a few today, and that's great that we're considering them. But at the same time, of course, you guys all have to be practical. So we need an alternative, and this does seem like the best one. It does come with risks, and, I, and I'm afraid of them too, just like a lot of other people. And I do think we need to very closely examine cost. There are legitimate concerns that I've heard about ridership and about erosion, and, but I know we have a lot of professionals looking at this all day long now for years. I urge you to do the right thing and to be courageous. You, you, you gotta push through this resistance. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, hello, I'm Sean Trum. I'm an advocate for the disabled and special needs community. Every Vision Santa Cruz County meeting and workshop had the same first concerns, traffic, homelessness, crime, and mental health crises. Many attendees meant those that they could see. People get stuck downtown. When arrested, suspects are brought downtown, then released downtown. Many are without support. Uh, and who does anyone go to when they need help? To their friends. If you need mental or physical health care, it's on Emmeline Street. Watsonville only serves traffic or small claims court uh, cases once a week. City of Watsonville is treated like a child by Santa Cruz. The Santa Cruz-Watsonville divide started when the railroad was first planned on our coast. There were different plans and competition, and since then, someone has always profited from encouraging an imaginary divide of race and culture. And the disability community needs people movers. 19 of 100 Americans lives with a disability. We all have the same needs. 
Disabled people are doing everything that you are, and some locals are doing things that no one else in the world is doing. Jeff Denholm leases a fleet of fire engines to our state forestry service and brought to market a biodegradable fire retardant already stockpiled around the state before the Camp Fire, the most expensive natural disaster in history. Foster Anderson broke his neck in a motorcycle uh, accident, then moved across the country to serve the needs of the disabled uh, Santa Cruz community for 30 years. I develop adaptive athletic teams and find them full funding for US and Hawaiian events. The technologies that allow mobility are not coming in 2035. They're here now, and the train is one of them. We're supposed to be helping one another. That's the reason we're all here today. Please do not delay to meet the needs of all of our community members. Cooperation is what makes America great. Thank Thanks. you. Commissioners uh, Lowell Hurst uh, from the city of Watsonville, I think you've heard it all today, and I think you've heard it all over the months and over the years and actually over the decades as well. You guys should be experts on this already, and I, and I think you are. Let's move forward. Let's be bold. Let's be brave. Let's be smart. Don't wimp out. Do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to go ahead and close the uh, public comment period. I'll bring it back. One, one thing I wanted to say before we, uh, the commissioners, decide on this is uh, we have two recommendations in front of us, as you can see on the staff report. One and two, one considers the final draft of the Unified Quarter Study, and two is granting the St. Uh, Paul the license. I'm going to split those up into two separate votes. So we're going to have uh, two items to talk about. So first item we're going to talk about is consider the finding of the final draft unified course study. I'm going to start with Commissioner Leopold. Um, Chair, are we making motions or are we just taking comments? What, what's the, the this is, we, we're going to have the conversation and a motion. This is, this, is the, we, this is what we've all been waiting for. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for everyone's participation. Uh, today and through the many months in which we've had this discussion. You know, the Unified Corridor Study uh, 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 started uh, about a year ago um, <laughs> in, in terms of a public process. There were public meetings held. There was a tremendous amount of outreach. There were requested meetings. There were additional meetings added. Uh, there were focus groups with stakeholders. Um, uh, we've heard hours of public testimony. We scheduled a special meeting in the evening to hear public testimony uh, where we heard more uh, testimony. We've received uh, emails, letters. Uh, many of us have received visits. Uh, uh, it's a, a dense uh, report that has a lot of information, some of which is easily uh, uh, acquired and some which takes a lot of uh, work to understand what exactly it means. Uh, we've had lots of chances to ask questions um, and I think it's, uh, if we had everybody stand up, we could, this commission could probably tell you where everybody in this room stands on this because <laughs> we've heard from you a bunch of times. The one thing that we learned in the, in the conversation uh, that led to the successful passage of Measure D is that we as a community don't want just one thing. We want many things. We, we care about a multimodal future because we, we choose to, to get around in different ways. Some choose to get around in cars, some on bikes, some would like other alternatives, um, and some get around on buses. And the one thing I know, uh, because uh, I spent a lot of time help, helping uh, us acquire the rail corridor, is that there was a commitment from this commission and a, and a requirement from our funders to look at uh, transit on that corridor. They wanted a train. Uh, and for a long time, it seemed like that would be the only thing we would consider. And, uh, but during this process, we've taken a look at a number of different things. We've, uh, uh, we heard from our transit partner in the transit district about doing an alternative analysis in which we are gonna take a look at the different uh, transportation alternatives that could go on there. But the fact remains is that we're gonna have transit on the rail corridor uh, in the future. And we're gonna have a path uh, that it's gonna be mainly 12 feet wide. There might be some places where it's only eight feet wide. Uh, but it, we will have an opportunity to have a 32 mile path that's protected from um, uh, traffic uh, and that will serve the needs of people. 
and we have already started construction. Uh, just last week, we started construction on, uh, on a small piece, but later on this year, the city of Santa Cruz is gonna start on segment seven. Uh, hopefully in 2020, we'll, we'll, we'll have completed the work to start the five miles on the north coast. Uh, either this year or next year, we start design work on a segment nine, which was connects uh, Seabright to, um, to 17th Avenue. Uh, and once the design work is done, we can start construction there. So we're underway with the construction of this trail. The, the uh, recommendation that's before us um, is a good recommendation. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, everything is my preference. Uh, I'm not a great fan of, of putting more concrete on the highway. But I do think that if we want to seriously consider bush on shoulder, we've done the analysis. There isn't the, uh, the, uh, the possibility of doing that with our existing concrete. And if we add the auxiliary lanes, which there are some who consider that to be important for their, for their car, um, that also provides a great opportunity for us with the bus. And we've, w one thing that we've heard, and th it may be uh, a unifying factor in our transportation discussions is people like our transit district and they want better options on our, uh, for our transit district. And so making sure that we have the infrastructure to be able to support our transit district becomes important. So I think that this uh, recommendation helps us uh, add that infrastructure to be able to um, support the bus on shoulders and it, it help increase uh, the reliability um, of getting the bus to and from North and South County or vice versa. Uh, I think the issue of, uh, of bicycle travel is really important and one of the things we know in uh, creating the, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail or the Rail Trail uh, is that having it separated from cars makes it a lot safer and what we believe and m most of the bicycle people that I talk to say will encourage people to actually ride. Um, we shouldn't think that that's the only place where uh, protection from vehicles is, is a great idea. And if I find fault in this uh, recommendation and I'm, I would suggest that we uh, make changes and prioritize protected bike lanes rather than simply buffered bike lanes, where that is uh, possible, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's really critical that people feel safe on their bike and any, any of us who've ridden a bike on Soquel Drive or Freedom or um, uh, some streets, it's, it can be terrifying. And if you have children with you, uh, all the more so. So in, in whatever we can do to, pr uh, to promote and prioritize uh, protected uh, bike lanes seems much better than buffered. On the, uh, I'll just add my comments about the rail, it is uh, we made a commitment when we purchased this line to have some kind of rail service on there. We tried to make it, uh, make the requirements as l least uh, impactful as possible, uh, but what we thought we needed to have the conversation with the public, but we do have requirements there. And uh, since we're going to be maintaining that, uh, that corridor for transit, uh, we should continue our, uh, uh, our contract with uh, Progressive Rail, who has shown to be uh, so far a good partner um, uh, with us on uh, the rail line that's currently open. And we should complete the repairs of the rail line and allow them to, uh, to uh, seek uh, a freight service on the North County uh, because when they are, if, if they are successful, that does take trucks off the roads, and that's safety and congestion relief. Um, and if excursion service works, uh, that's a benefit because one of the pillars of our economy is tourism. So I, I think it's important for us to move forward. It does not preclude us looking at other things on that corridor for transit. Uh, but uh, for those who think it's, um, um, uh, it's gonna be easy to extricate ourselves from having a rail line. I, uh, th as someone who was very involved in just acquiring the rail line, even when we were purchasing the rail line under the exact same conditions that the previous owner had, it took a long time just to get that through the STB. And that was, that was not making any changes. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that 
for those people who think that we should have direct democracy on this and just vote on something, uh, the, the history is not great. When, when this commission in 2004 decided that they would primarily uh, uh, put a measure, they would put a measure on the ballot that primarily had HOV lanes, required a two-thirds vote, and it got 47%. So uh, when we put a multimodal uh, measure on there that addressed many different needs, we got the necessary two-thirds. So um, putting something on there without the, uh, adequate information doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get a, a, a good sense of what people want. Uh, and we have spent so much time, so much energy, we have received so much testimony that there are 12 uh, representatives, most of us elected, um, to be able to sort through that and, and make a decision. We are representatives of the people. So I don't support going out and, and just trying to say yay or nay on a particular um, uh, point of view. So I would be prepared to move the recommendations and the change the, the resolution just to put protected uh, bike lanes instead of buffered or protected bike, bike lanes um, it, it, uh, in this resolution. Is there a second? Second. It's a second. Okay. Uh, who else would like to? I'll start down this end, Mr. Cap. Uh, I was going to mention that at one point, every uh, all of you, in order to get to this position, uh, were allies. There's people that are for the bike. There's people for the uh, trail. People for the uh, uh, rail uh, rail line, and so. I'm, I'm for all three of them. And I know there are people that say if you're all for all three of them, they're all gonna fail. I don't think so. I'm ready to move forward. I think we, if somebody said, hey, we're gonna move forward and we're gonna drop the uh, bicycle path, I would be against that. I would say, no, we have to have the bicycle path. If they said we're not gonna have a walking trail, uh, but we're gonna go for rail and bike, I'd say no. Uh, and if you say you're going to have the bike and the walking trail only and not have rail, I would say no. So what I'm saying is, uh, saying is we were allies at one point and we're, we should be allies right now. We want to go forward. Doing nothing is really not an option. We can't just sit here and, and not do anything with it. We have to move forward. I think what we're voting on today is, is going to be moving forward. Uh, I did hear one comment that, uh, you know, farmers are for the bikes and for the walking trail. There are far farmers that are only for the rail line and passenger service is okay and freight service is okay. They don't want people on bikes going through their farmland. They don't want people walking through their farmland uh, because of when they do uh, pesticide uh, and um, um, you know, putting uh, uh, pesticide out on their fields. So they don't want to be have people exposed to that. But we purchased a rail line uh, when I first got on the board of uh, uh, the supervisors. And I remember clearly it said we're purchasing a rail line. We can't just now say we're changing the deed. I think that deed has strong limitations on what we can do. We can't just discard the, uh, the rail line. It's, it, it runs with the land. It runs with the purchase. It's part of the contract. And uh, is there any clarification on that? Am I correct? Uh, if we said we're not going to do anything with the rail, we're just going to do a bike trail and a walking trail, would we be violating the contract and maybe conditions uh, that are running in, with the land? I'm going, I'm going to read directly from a letter that we received from the California Transportation Commission. Um, as you are aware, Proposition 116 funds must be used for rail projects within Santa Cruz, which facilitate recreational, commuter, inner city, and inner county travel. Okay, and then uh, I'll close out by saying this. <clears throat> I've heard about banking. Uh, but uh, to me, the problem with uh, the word banking, it sounds like you can go and make a deposit 
and then uh, within a day or two, if you need money, you can go and make a withdrawal. Uh, when you bank a rail line, you're only banking it and you're not gonna be able to get it back. I mean, it's not that easy. We're talking about years. Once it's banked and it's paved over, uh, you don't just go and uh, uh, bring it back without a huge delay and a huge amount of money. So anyway, I'm, I'm just uh, making that clear. So I, I'm ready to vote on this and- well, I wanna hear from every other committee. Yeah, I, so. I agree. Yeah. I'll second the motion, though. Uh, the motion's been second. Uh, I'll go to Commissioner Bertrand. You bet. Thank you. Uh, I'll be honest. My Christmas had sort of a pale over it. After we decided to put off our vote and move to now. In general, I think public is in a similar situation. We've been asked to make a decision that we know is gonna come back to us in the form of a tax rate increase, maybe some other kind of thing, like for property owners, a, a, a levy on their property. One of the issues that's bothered me is trying to make sense of what the proposals are that are in all these different scenarios and how they best meet the needs of this community. That's why I jumped on to the RTC because I thought the UCS would provide that. I'm a little more confused. Yes, SB1 says we need to look at all these different categories and those are addressed in the UCS. And so we're following the law. But it doesn't leave me with the clear feeling that we can afford it. So I have an MBA. I was the city treasurer at Capitola, and I started focusing on what is feasible. There's a lot of aspirational goals that we have. I would love to remodel my house. If you saw it, you could tell why. I would love to do all sorts of other things. My car is a wreck, I just got him one. Maybe I should get another one because it doesn't look nice. Or I would love to put my kids through better schools. But those are aspirational things and you do what you can do based on what your income is. In this case, it's the income that Santa Cruz residents, the commercial activity, whether it's wage or whether it's visitors, can afford us in terms of tax revenues. So my earlier comments was talking about Metro's take on this. And I was very happy to see what I think is a change in the direction of the RTC. If Metro says that we're almost at the brink of being able to provide decent service. Many of us were in the room when we heard people from transportation areas of this country talk to us about what makes sense is a decent metro system, decent fares, best able to expand and contract as needed. But when metro comes to us and says, we need to look carefully at what the options are and do what I think a lot of us think of when we're trying to make a decision that's a financial decision, is a cost-benefit analysis of what we're gonna get for the dollars we're gonna spend. I was very encouraged, I met with Guy, I was very encouraged to hear him say that this is something that I would like to move forward on. It's in our resolution. Not the way I would write it, but it's the same content. And I don't wanna put words in the RTC's mouth. But my sense is that we're not gonna move forward on things that we can't afford. I hope that's correct. The proposals that the RTC will get as they make recommendations will be proposals that come to us and we'll have to make decisions on that. So some of those are gonna be in the future. But also as it says in the resolution, that we don't have a preferred solution right now. We don't have preferred ways to move forward because we're going to evaluate. To me, this is what you need to do when you determine that you're going to take the best use of public dollars. 
The best use of public dollars is an enormous responsibility. Because every time we decide to spend money on something, we're taking money away from something else. We have huge needs in this community. Educate our children. You can't walk almost anywhere in, Cap in, in Capitol, or partially, but in Santa Cruz and see homeless issues. Housing. The roads aren't just bad on Highway 1, they're, hot, they're bad all up and down the valley. I was in San Lorenzo Valley. We have huge needs in this area. So in terms of a cost-best analysis, how much money we're gonna take away from the public purse and spend on something that's in the corridor to some extent is aspirational, but we need that analysis to figure out if it's still something that's possible. A few other points. I am for protected bike lanes. I've um, done cross country biking. Having a truck go by you, a semi, is not fun. Um, I look in terms of the um, excursion rail, I would love to start talking with Roaring Camp and the excursion rail up north. I'm not sure where it should end, but I think that is a high possibility for success. I think it's been said, Bruce just mentioned, that one of the main aspects, one of the main stool seat, uh, school, one of the main things that support this area in terms of economic activity is tourism. I was on Focus Ag and I talked to people up in Davenport. They would love to have people come up that way. I'm very, 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 very happy to see that part of this is going to be an integrative approach to how we're, going to appro how we're going to plan our transportation. If we're going to have buses, how are they going to link into something that's potentially on the corridor? How are we going to link with UC? How are we going to link with the bus schedules and stuff like that? We had someone very articulately detail how we have so many problems right now with Metro. I'm from Capitola. Try to get a connection at our, at our bus terminal from Santa Cruz to somewhere else. It's very on, you just can't predict it. This is not working. So I'd like to close with this. You did hear some comments from Mr. Woodside, who was part of the SMART uh, effort that's seemingly successful in Marin, Sonoma. And I think his comments have to be taken very seriously. We need the, the base to support any kind of effort that's gonna demand an economic, <coughs> excuse me, an economic draw in terms of taxes. They have it in Marin. They have it in Sonoma. So what are we gonna do that somehow solves our transportation issues, but still within our budget, still within our means to do it. And that's what I'm looking forward to in this analysis that I hope we provide. It was also said earlier that provide that information to the public in ways they can understand it. Ultimately, we just talked about direct election. Ultimately, if the public cannot understand the information given to it, you're not gonna get the support. The ultimate here is the ballot box. Thank you. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I wanna be clear that this resolution um, is to maximize the benefits for safety, efficient mobility, health equity, natural environment, and economic vitality. All of these have been brought up as concerns from everybody that has spoke at the, the podium here, as well as what we've done here as commissioners to read through the materials, listen to what RTC has been uh, providing us with documentation, <coughs> and substantiating that documentation from outside agencies. And I just wanna be very crystal clear that my vote today is based off of all of the information I'm collecting, all of the discussions I've had with you that have had an opportunity to meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, or the, the infamous emails where we're, we're all been um, going through as well. I've made a dedicated effort to make sure that I was able to go out there to meet with you, to do my due diligence, to read everything, um, 
and to, to research as much as I can, especially being one of the newest commissioners here with um, quite a large um, learning curve. Um, I know that there's also a lot of misinformation that's out there, and it's been really frustrating to hear um, what's going on with cherry picking and, and, and the like, which is another reason why I, I don't take it from what the print is telling me, but to make sure from where the agency resource comes from that's giving us the information we're using for this report um, before I'm even reaching to any conclusions. This vote is to represent Watsonville. Those are the residents that I'm here representing. Those are the ones that are concerned the most, especially when we're in that Highway 1 parking lot and the kind of relief efforts that they're after. And we know that we have to make compromises. This isn't a perfect plan or a perfect solution. This is something for us to move forward with. We still have to do a lot more analysis work. We have to still deal with the environmental issues, the, the uh, issues with where money's gonna come from. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, uh, we, we expect the RTC to just roll over every rock they possibly can find to find out where this money's gonna come from for these projects and leverage what we possibly can with the Measure D funds, because obviously Measure D funds are, are barely a down payment for getting um, any of these projects started, let alone um, to be, to be um, completed. We know that this is a live planning document, and it's to help us set the course for what we want to do for transportation needs. I mean, most of you don't even know what you're gonna plan for dinner, and yet we're doing something here for the next 20 or 30 years out. Th there's a lot involved in this. We don't need to rule out things that haven't had a full um, process to make use of what we have. We have limited resources here, not only of funding, but we also have limited land resource uses that are here. Um, we have the density that's going on. We have very little in terms of what to work with to make it flexible. We can't add these other lanes that, that can't exist because we financially can't do that and we don't have the land space for doing it. We have to be as creative as possible. This particular resolution gives us that with guidelines in order to achieve those, uh, the criteria that we need here. We're, we're getting things in here that are buffered and protected. We definitely understand um, the safety component. Vision Zero is what Watsonville's adopted and we're looking at having this plan seriously integrate a lot of what that vision is that we have for Watsonville. We've heard from Metro, as you know, several of us are commissioners with Metro, and we've heard the word cannibalization. We certainly aren't up here to make a vote on something that's going to do any type of devastating damages for uh, what infrastructure we have out there now. We want it to work cohesively. We want to work collaboratively. We want to make sure that, again, it's the highest and best efficient use and resource, and also the time it takes because we do know that there's a huge divide in this county in terms of the resources that we have, how they're being spent, and the cost of, to the quality of life of many people that are in this community, and the frustrations. Because there's a tremendous amount of frustration when it comes time to planning your life on what you can do, and the sacrifices you make to get the wages that you need for your family to be able to come home and put food on the table, and for the cost of living that we have in this community. <coughs> Um, I, I want to have something moving forward. We don't need to, to delay this. We're, we're hearing you're, you're rushing this through. We're, this is not a rush job. Um, we know that we still need to be very thorough and very um, set on, on making sure that we're stewards of the taxpayers' money. Um, <coughs> we need to decide which wheels to move forward with in this corridor. I, I think that this is a little bit of a sidestep to say mass transit versus the train. So that part has been listened to from what the recommendation was initially. So we will go through the due diligence process of finding out the highest and best use of what wheels will need to go in that particular corridor based on the history lesson, which gives us a direction we need to look at train, but we'll get to the outcome once we're thorough with that type of research. Um, again, the message that I have from Watsonville is that they want the train for the mass public <coughs> transit in the corridor, but are patient to go through the process to, d to see what the outcome is going to be on that one. 
and they know, or what we all know that we need to have the patience on, on reaching that, and our, our patience is right at the threshold at this point. We've waited a really long time. We've talked about the public safety for the bicycles and pedestrians, but they're not the primary modality we're gonna find from Watsonville coming to mid to North County. It's, it's to complement what we need to on the modalities. Um, the first mile, last mile is a big piece of that and how Metro can complement that. I wanna see that we can get more of our youth to those education um, resources that we have mid and, and North County. And I think transportation is a huge factor in doing that. We know we found money, $115 million for the Fish Hook Mission Project. Money can be found. It's the RTC's responsibility and um, assignment to find the resources we need for that. Because I'll tell you, South County's looking at $115 million being spent at the North County, and they're saying, where is it at the, out, the South End for this relief? We're told that every project that works its way South will help Watsonville, but every single project that works its way South is just still providing a, a, a neutral relief as we get more people on that, that corridor. So Watsonville still doesn't see the relief that every single um, one of these ancillary lanes has. When it comes to the time, we, Measure D took two years. 2016, we passed it, barely with two thirds. We had to compromise to put something on the ballot to make that happen. We're still not gonna see tires on pavement, likely for one of the auxiliary lanes until maybe 2022. We're talking six years to have some relief of something that the voters have decided on. We know that even if this train was gonna be here a decade in the course of land use planning and transportation planning is probably a short window, but we have to realize that we've been working on this since the 90s on what to do with the corridor and the transportation needs. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, we've talked about that. And again, we, we're looking at the overall equity and the health of everything and all of the components that go with that. And it will be the responsibility of the RTC staff to work with us to make sure each of those goals are achieved and that we work through that process to make that efficiency um, and the, the selection of the projects and prioritizing the projects that we can do to make that happen. Um, and as a representative for Watsonville, it's my obligation representing my constituents to approve the resolution and instruct the RTC to take this action, to be thorough, to be transparent, to be inclusive, to be creative and productive and in, in achieving um, the projects that we can successfully uh, accomplish that are on this list of, of items here. And that's where I'm coming from and what my message is. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I had a quick question about um, working jointly with Metro on this process. So does that mean that they will have a person at the table that kind of uh, take, takes in this information side by side with people from the RTC? Absolutely. Okay, because I think that's important to get on bias and, and, and fair statement. So <clears throat> I think, you know, at the core of my concern is, a, is a cost versus benefits. And cost always has to enter the equation because uh, it's been mentioned uh, that that's why we tax ourselves, because we tax ourselves for things that we think are going to be important. Measure D was part of, to quote, get this uh, tr uh, Santa Cruz County moving again. Hasn't happened. And I keep hearing uh, things like 10 years hence, we're gonna start moving and this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen. Um, I'm not afraid of the future, but at the same time, I respect the past. And one of the things I think when we pay attention to the past, history, uh, we don't wanna exclude things that show us uh, in detail what's real and what isn't. Um, if you look at history, uh, and one of my concerns with train, of course, is you keep, you keep hearing that uh, 3,000, 4,000 people on this rail line will make it feasible. But if you talk to people who do trains, it's more than the 12,500 to 15,000 people on, on, on daily trips that make things work. And even then, sometimes it's, it's a little <coughs> iffy. Um, the, the rail feasibility study, <coughs> excuse me, as you can tell, I have a cold. <clears throat> in, 19, in 2016 was very, very, very iffy in terms of supporting uh, rail. And that kind of is the core to wh what my concerns are. Um, you know, Bruce and I live in uh, Fifth District, Scotts Valley, 
uh, all, all the way up through San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, we don't take we don't take advantage of these things, okay? But we were willing to support p parts of Measure D because we know, for example, that widening the highway will in fact work, okay? For those people who are concerned about um, greenhouse gases, um, you talk about having a, a train that you'll drop in a electric uh, uh, motorized by electricity. But the same thing is going to happen in f 5, 10, 15 years for cars. You're going to see more and more and more. Every company is moving towards electrified vehicles. Um, you know, I'm glad that the, the commission is pumping the brakes a little bit in terms of, you know, looking at uh, uh, alternative analysis. Bill, Small, Bill Smallman was here from San Lorenzo Valley, I believe, talking about a benefit of a corridor that would allow water to be moved at a fraction of the cost. That's innovative to me, okay? So the more we kind of push forward in a rush, ki kind of obviates the, the, the process of us being able to analyze what other benefits might arise out of the process that we're trying to pursue. You know, um, I, I heard a woman talk about 20 cards that were signed, okay, at uh, flea markets or wherever. But there were 10,000 signatures signed uh, that wanted a trail only. Now I think that trail only is, is migrating more towards incorporating other aspects, maybe bus rapid transit and so forth. And to me, that's important, okay? So um, I'm not opposed to, um, you know, what, what works, but I do want us to be very realistic. And, you know, there are things on, on this here that uh, I like, certain things that I don't like, but um, I'm willing to listen to the, the people. I'm willing to talk to them. I'm willing to have an open mind. But I don't want to ignore history. And history has shown that expensive rail systems, you have to be pretty sure that they're going to work. And a lot of times they don't. Um, and that's my only concern. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Mulhern. Okay, um, I just wanted to make a, uh, I th you know, to, to get back to Measure D very briefly, things have happened that wouldn't have happened already uh, without Measure D. I mean, you can see the construction projects going on and the major re uh, recipient of those funds, 30% of them was for local roads. And I think people in, throughout this county have seen uh, improvements been make to, made to local roads since Measure D was passed in 2016. So it's it's paying dividends as we speak. Uh, I just want to make clear that uh, we're the we're these are two motions, and I'm just going to speak to the first one at this point. Uh, that I really appreciate the uh, language and the staff recommendation that positively uh, responds to the request made by the Metro Board. Uh, to analyze all transit options. And uh, I want to thank our new director, Guy Preston, for recognizing the importance of the existing uh, transit system, the need to have a deeper understanding uh, of the capital operation and financial needs of that system relative to how we ultimately decide the use of the rail corridor. And so that's what I see as uh, the first item that we're going to vote on, and that's the only comments that I would like to make toward that end. I'll jump all the way down to Commissioner Chase. Um, I just wanted to <laughs> echo some of the comments that were already made, uh, in particular as a Metro rep, really appreciating the change in the language that was made to really address the concerns of Metro. I do want to clarify that the um, motion that was made at the Santa Cruz City Council in December, my understanding is that that is potentially not necessary for us to make any modifications because those items will be considered as part of the projects and <coughs> moving forward. Or it, could you clarify that? Yes. Um, the projects that the city of Santa Cruz would want to move um, forward with, I heard from, from the city and the, the city engineer spoke to us today. Um, it does not preclude um, any funding to be put towards those projects in the future. This is a planning, a regional corridor planning study. Um, so um, all of the funding mechanisms that the city had been considering um, for their projects are still available funding sources. Okay, and I, I just want to clarify too that in our discussion at council, uh, we really did focus on multi multimodal. So it wasn't just around the vehicle um, 
accommodations and projects related to that, but we really did emphasize that the improvements really would need to be focused on multimodal transportation. Um, and then I'll just wrap up by saying a lot of people were thinking that I wasn't going to be here today. Um, because the date got moved and I'm glad that I am because I've been a part of years of listening to folks and I think that this uh, commission has been responsive to things we've modified and changed based on the feedback we've heard and so I'm happy to be here to finalize the vote today um, based on the feedback that we've heard so thank you. Commissioner Rodkin. First of all, I, I want to appreciate everybody's comments and the tone of people's comments today. It's much better than some past meetings that we've had, and I, don't, I never take that for granted. I don't think anybody that spoke today has got some bizarre, narrow interest that makes it inappropriate for their comments. So, you know, people, I think, honestly, are trying to express their concerns about things, and there are many contradictions in what we're trying to do here that make it that, you know, a comment that I might go, well, I have an answer to that. And believe me, people have been in meetings with me before. No, I, I listened to what everybody said, and I can answer almost every point that people made. My colleagues don't have the patience for that, so I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I, I just want to say that um, I think that the decision to have a preferred rail option that, however, makes clear that that doesn't prohibit a serious study of what the mode will be on the, uh, on the rail corridor is, is the appropriate balance. Uh, that's achieved in the resolution that's in front of us. I think that's a little tricky. Seems like a preferred choice means the decision's been made. It clearly has not been made. The rest of the comment I want to make has to do with the uh, difficulty in being in a situation where you have to face the reality of other agencies that have control over your decision and ultimately you don't control everything. So when people raise concerns, you know, well, why would we keep these rails in place? Uh, everybody knows that whatever rail thing we end up with for passenger rail in the end, if it's passenger rail, or certainly if it ends up being a bus thing of some kind or, or a PRT, the, these, the, the, you wouldn't be using these rails. You'd be using a continuously welded modern rail system of some kind. The reason for keeping the rails in, just to be clear that which my vote is based on, has to do with making sure not only that we don't lose the 10 or 11, or maybe somebody said 15, but I think it's more like 11 million bucks of the 116 money, it has much more to do with preserving our ownership of this right away. That, you know, we need more information about it, but it's like the idea that somehow we would tear the rails out and then hope that the CTC would, you know, not only would they let us keep the money, in the scheme of these things, $10 million is a massive amount of money, but it's nothing really in terms of what we're doing overall. But, but the idea that the property owners would all be suing us immediately for their right underlying land, and we might lose the whole thing, would be a complete disaster from my point of view. So I, that's one of the reasons why I'm willing to keep the cr current rail in rather than pull it out for a rail banking scheme or um, aside from the fact that rail banking has never actually happened anywhere where it came back. But um, that could change. I, I wouldn't base everything just on that. But the idea that we would risk this corridor after we've finally got it after all this work, that'd be a disaster. Um, I think there has to be public transit. I like the phrase that the staff has used here, The uh, I've probably forgotten what it is already, but it's the, you know, um, having some kind of a, uh, a transit quarter that, that moves lots of people, sort of, you know, mass transit on this quarter, not just bicycles. I don't own a car. Uh, I have a motorcycle, a bicycle, and a bus pass, and that's how I get around. I rent cars if I have to go somewhere far away that you can't get to with a, I don't want to ride my motorcycle over Highway 17. <laughs> but despite my, you know, love of bicycling and riding up to UCSC and all this other stuff, we need to move a lot of people, and it's not realistic to think that people are really, weather aside, going to ride their bicycles, and I don't care how electric they are, from Watsonville to Santa Cruz for a job in our town. It's not going to happen. It will happen for some people. I would do it, but you're not going to persuade any modal shift to happen on that basis. So we need some form of public mass, mass transit on this corridor, and I want to make sure that that happens. Um, the final thing I want to talk to is um, actually two more things. The auxiliary lanes. I, I liked what um, John Leopold had to say about that. I, I'm not a fan of auxiliary lanes. I don't think, I do believe in induced traffic. I don't think in the end you're going to reduce the congestion. We had a public speaker that came in our series that told us, in fact, two of them told us this, but one guy was really clear about it. Nothing you can do will deal with congestion. You can provide people alternatives, to ways to get somewhere without being stuck in the congestion, but whatever expansion of highway space you give, people will take it up, and you, the, the, as it shows in our own studies, eventually you'll lose the benefit of having done it. But as John pointed out, 
we don't have a place to run buses. Our buses are stuck in the traffic right now, and the idea of those auxiliary lanes, I don't know that I'll ever be able to persuade others to join this vision, but at some point I'd love to see those auxiliary lanes take the cars off of them and make it into a pure bus lane that runs down there. That's not the current view. I'm willing to take the risk that I won't be successful, and the buses will have to share that lane with some cars, but nonetheless, Having some way for buses to get here, rather than being stuck in the traffic with all the cars, is absolutely essential. We send three or four, sometimes even five buses between Santa Cruz and Watsonville for a route that would take one bus if it could, could get back quickly enough to be used again. But there's three of them out there on the highway waiting to come back. And so the cost to the district of having buses stuck in traffic is huge in terms of uh, and that's not just the buses, the drivers and their salaries are stuck out there as well. So as somebody who doesn't like widening highways, I still support this auxiliary lane plan just because I think in the long run it's part of what we need to do to get where we have to be. Finally, um, people ask the very reasonable question, why would we make a contract with a company that focuses on freight and maybe excursion services, even they don't even provide that, they're gonna find a subcontractor to do excursion service, but why would we make a contract with these guys when what we really want is some form of passenger service, you know, that's not an excursion thing on the weekend or something. Um, the answer to that has to do, once again, with these, the pra pragmatic reality of showing the CTC that we're moving forward with train. They've, uh, if I, I don't know why they think having freight service and, um, uh, excursion service is a mark of our commitment to eventually have uh, rail. You can make an argument that that's not the best way to go, that the freight is really in a way almost competes with the passenger stuff and we shouldn't be going there. But I really looked into this carefully and really tried to understand it. And my view is that we need to do this. We're not going to have passenger service on this uh, on this route, the serious passenger service. And again, it's not a, we're not talking about a diesel train. It's some kind of a battery uh, battery operated trolley or tram or something that that's what i'm looking for. that's what we that's what we can afford and that's what we probably would carry the passengers we need here given our population but my view is this is a way to get to where we need to be that's always hard the public don't always appreciate that people want why can't we get this doing going now can't we have the train tomorrow and stuff Unfortunately, I was spent 26 years on the Santa Cruz City Council. I know that you don't get anything tomorrow. I mean, things take time to happen. And a public transit corridor that goes between two different cities and requires federal and state funding, it, it takes time. It's gonna be, but it would be irresponsible of us to go, well, it's gonna take too long and therefore let's just come up, let's do a bike path now and we could have, that would give a lot of, some people would get on the bike path and ride it from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, but we, we have to plan for the future. This, that's our obligation as a, as a commission. We're, we're not, we're providing the actual service, the transit district does that, but we have to plan for how we actually will solve these problems. And I, if they could be solved in 10 years, my God, I would be so happy. 10 years is optimistic, and that's just the reality of the world that we live in. But if we don't make these commitments now, we'll be in big trouble. And I think if we don't sign this contract, um, or allow the contract to continue as we had planned with uh, the, the folks from uh, Minnesota. I, I think in the end we would lose this right of way. We'd have other kinds Same of problems. Topic right now. We're just on item one. I understand. Yeah, I'm, thank you. It's going to save me speaking on the next one. That, that's all right. I just want to stay on topic. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to say I think that the preferred scenario is a reasonable scenario. It doesn't give me, a, I, it's not the one I would pick if I got to vote if I were the czar here or something. It's the one this community will support and it's the best we can do. And I think it's pretty good. I don't feel like it's, oh, we have to suffer through it. It's all we can afford. No, it's not a bad plan. It's a very good plan given what our real constraints are and I'm going to support it. Mr. Sure. Um, first of all, I want to, like Mike, recognize the tone and the quality of the uh, comments from both sides. Dare I say that maybe we forced you all through so many painful meetings that friendship and respect is beginning to develop between uh, everyone. But uh, uh, but I uh, but I think we're, uh, there's been a real improvement. So what, I mean, uh, there's a couple big picture things that I want to focus on uh, in my hopefully brief remarks. First um, is that while we're spending an inordinate amount of time on the uh, rail corridor, uh, one thing to remember is that we have all these other corridors and we actually have agreement. The first time in my lifetime that we have an agreement on what we're going to do next on Highway 1. We have an agreement for how we want to work with the Metro that agreement for what we want to do on the Soquel Corridor, and that, and because of the voters, for the first time in my lifetime, there's actually money to do it, or at least 
part of it. Um, that is a big, uh, it's not universal agreement as we heard, but uh, that is a major uh, step forward for this community uh, and really hopefully bridging some of the divisions that have, uh, that have hurt this county and most importantly the residents in this community uh, for a long, long time. And so I'm really optimistic about all the other, all the um, recommendations in the plan and getting to implement them. Uh, the second piece is what I, it sounds like based on uh, where the commissioners are voting today is we're really moving forward with a commitment in the corridor uh, to a trail and transit. And um, what that's from the beginning, what's been important to me is to recognize that we retain the optionality uh, as transportation is going through a real revolution and whether it's e-bikes or electric cars, self-driving cars, light rail, all these things that we preserve our ability for future generations um, to figure out how best to move across this county um, in, the, in, the most, in the best way possible with the most equity and uh, lowest carbon footprint possible. And I think that is um, where we're going. And finally, uh, about a public referendum, um, I think that's always a possibility in California. Let me just say, uh, we spent a lot of time debating and talking to each other. Uh, you will have two ballot questions. One ballot question will say, do you wanna build a world-class trail through the county? And people will say yes. Uh, and the other ballot question will say, do you wanna give back $20 million and delay a trail for 10 years and, uh, and, uh, and rip out the tracks? And people will say no. And then we'll spend another four years arguing about what those results meant. Um, so let's not waste our time and effort uh, uh, and let's start moving forward. And today, um, we also need to recognize that this organization, all of our cities and county, has a limited amount of time uh, and resources and money and we need to start getting to projects right now that will improve the quality of life for people right now, that will reduce our carbon footprint right now. Um, and we've done a lot of planning and we've done a lot of conversations, but we need to start uh, having a bias towards action uh, for both, uh, for all the environmental reasons and the climate change, but also for the quality of life of people who are trying to get back and forth to work, to jobs, to schools, back to their families. Um, we, we, have, we have a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of small um, programs that can make a big difference in cumulative, and I think that's, our, that's a big opportunity, and um, I'm excited to be moving forward. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Um, so I just want to, uh, at the outset, express my appreciation for all the folks who have been involved in this really long, um, somewhat daunting process of, um, so staff, com fellow commissioners, uh, members of the public who have read copious amounts of materials, I mean, with thousands of pages. I looked at the stack on my floor in my office uh, yesterday and it was, you know, this high and that just doesn't even include most of the, the materials that we've, we've received and, and sifted through over the, uh, the course of this uh, planning process. And I really appreciate staff for making the, you know, really difficult, challenging information accessible to us, answering our questions. And to those of you in the community who, you know, have, have engaged and, and really uh, demonstrate that you care very much about um, how we um, make decisions for the future, how we make decisions now <laughs> that will um, uh, affect our future. Um, so, you know, I would just say as a commissioner, I feel quite, I know I have my, um, you know, own preferred scenario I could come up with in my mind and then I could convince myself that there are all kinds of problems with that. Um, this is a really complex um, uh, set of, of projects and, and considerations that we, um, we're looking at here. Uh, you know, as commissioners, I think we're obligated to look at the big picture and um, to weigh diverse, sometimes competing interests and demands, um, at least with, with respect to, or certainly with respect to funding funding priorities, um, and to make our best assessments around some overarching questions, and I just want to organize my uh, brief comments in those areas. Um, so one, does the UCS improve transportation options for re residents of the county? One speaker suggested that 
scenario B cannot be reconciled. Um, but I think the same could be said of any s scenario and any or any constellation of priorities and, and, and projects that we, we put together. Um, so the question is, how do we put together a package that, that does meet those, best meet those priorities and expectations um, and needs of the community? And, you know, I would, I would add, uh, because it is significant, the voters who agreed to be taxed to support these multimodal transportation options. Um, does the decision we make today constrain future decision making, and if so, how? You know, we a lot people come to us and tell us we're locking ourselves in to future um, planning and you know future you know major commitments of funding um, that we're precluding certain possibilities. And I think it's our responsibility to um, make decisions now that um, that do not constrain the possibilities for the future, given that new technologies will be coming before us. I mean, we'll be think you know, the future commissioners and the public that sits here, um, you know, decades from now, will be making decisions based in a completely you know a world that we can't even imagine in terms of new technologies and you know the way some of this plays out with the regulatory environment, funding possibilities, etc. So we want to pave the way for that future and. Um, you know, be ready for taking some action now. Um, uh, so, um, also, I think that we have a responsibility to, um, you know, be good stewards of the public um, public resources, public dollars. And I believe that making these decisions now um, are in the best interest um, for the, the future. Also, you know, we have this this all of these environmental concerns, public safety concerns, uh, you know, health equity um, that we need to weigh. You know, those perspectives need to be um, to weighed, and we um, have to make our again our best assessments of how the decisions we make now um, will um, meet those. Um, priorities. Um, so, and I think that we've, on balance, done a pretty good job. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's not easy to to sift through all this information and, and really, um, you know, understand it and, and digest it. It's not easy to, um, you know, to weigh all of those competing interests. My, I personally, I'll say a few things about the, um, you know, I do appreciate, first of all, the, the language changes uh, related to um, high density transit and protected bike lanes, those are big priorities for me. Um, so I appreciate that those have, um, have been included here for our consideration today. I um, personally um, believe in induced demand. So I don't think that um, the, and I don't think that anything I've read uh, convinces me that um, what we've read um, in terms of some of the whereas in this resolution that I'm um, you know, going to, to support us moving forward with, um, that, um, that we've identified Benefit, certain benefits of auxiliary lanes and metering on ramps um, to improve safety and traffic flow. I, I, I don't believe that, but it's in here, and um, on balance, I think that um, the, the plan does a lot of things that I like. So I also don't um, think that we have seen that the Unified Corridor Investment Study recognizes long-term benefits of high occupancy vehicle lanes on Highway 1. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm not saying I disagree, but I don't know. Um, and um, you know, and also that um, highway widening is going to be the solution. So you know, I, I disagree with that. I think it's our responsibility to say that, even when we are being asked to um, potentially pave the way for um, some of those projects. So um, that being said, I um, I want to just reiterate my, my gratitude for all of the time that people have spent. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's daunting to be making this decision today in some ways, but it's also um, kind of feels anticlimactic because we're, um, we're really just, this is the culmination of something, but it's actually really just the starting point for uh, the, the future. So um, thank you all for um, being here and participating. I look forward to the future. Thank you. Okay, the good news is um, I'm the last speaker and I'm gonna be short. Um, somebody mentioned that, uh, th that th it depends on which side you're on out there. And my experience over the past two years with this is this not, you guys are not like a side, you're like a salad, okay? It's not just the train or the bike, it, it, it's so many different things, okay? And I've, I know much more about PRT than I ever knew existed, okay? so. Um, so the dilemma comes to us is, you know, we're sitting here trying to figure out what's best for us. And, and you know, I, I share some of the concerns of the, of the fellow commissioners. For me, 
I'm here as a Capitola City Councilman, which gets me nominated to the Metro Board, that gets me selected to be on the RTC. So I'm coming from Capitola. It's a town that had Vision Capitola, and we just had the Measure L that, 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 uh, that lost. I come from a town that doesn't want to train. And then I go to Metro, and I'm uh, working on a, trying to deliver the best possible bus service we can do. And we have a, a CEO that's motivated to provide good things. And I'm thinking, what's best for Metro? Is it best for Metro to run on, on an HOV lane or bus on shoulder down Highway 1 or on, or on the trail? And I personally think that the best place for it to be is on Highway 1 in some expeditious manner. And then I come here as an RTC commissioner, trying to be inspired by, by transportation, which I am by, by all the staff here, because you can't be around them and not be inspired. So I think what, what helps me try to take what we're gonna do here is, is we're gonna pick a preferred scenario and we're gonna use it as a guideline to, to give us at least some place to move forward because I'm for uh, the, with the language in here, high capacity public alternatives. Because I'm gonna tell you, the way the future is changing so fast, somebody made a comment about how it's going to change. We have to be open to what it's going to do. The corridor is there, uh, so many other good uses on it. I don't know what that transportation mode is going to be on there, but I think we should continue looking at it, and, and, and maybe as we're doing the other projects, it'll present itself. So with that, uh, I'm going to be supporting the, the, uh, the preferred scenario, and I'm ready to have a, a roll call vote if, if you would go ahead and do that. This is just on item one. Well, my motion was uh, was the recommended actions and and the the resolution. Well, we're going to take the resolution with that, with the exception of item ten would not be on there and item two would not be on there. Well, I the, stated that at the beginning that, that we're only going to vote on. I took that as as uh, as we, that's what we we're going to have. We we're going to talk about it, but I made a motion that inclu that was inclusive of everything. You can divide a question. Yeah, I, I, I think I clearly stated in the beginning that it was only going to be on item one, and I preclude anybody from talking on item two because we're just going to vote on that. So if you want to reamend your motion to just include item one. Well, you don't you have to change you, 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 the chair. You should just divide the motion the way you're trying. I did that. I did that already, and I just, I just want to make sure that Commissioner Leopold's clear that we're just voting on item one. And the resolution would include, the resolution could be divided, if I'm correct, into uh, nine items, and then item 10 would be... Uh, one of its own? Yes, you can do that. Thank you. Oh, hold, before, before we call it, are we clear with that? Let's go ahead and go with a, a, a roll call vote on, on item one. Commissioner Chase? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Commissioner Coonerty? Aye. Commissioner Leopold? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Bator? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Mulhern? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Aye. Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Amazing, that is a unanimous vote. Uh, and I think it sends a great message to the community and to staff. So with that, uh, let's move on to item two, which is a uh, item to grant St. Paul Railroad a license to use the Santa Cruz Branch Rail. Um, and but I'm going to start with Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I know that uh, we were going to combine these, but um, I'd like to make a recommendation uh, on number two. Um, and I know there's going to be moans and groans. We've been talking about this for a couple of years now. But we have a deadline of March 15th. And the motion I'm going to make is, is certainly not uh, to be negative reflection on the uh, progressive rail because uh, their freight service to Watsonville, they've done what they've said they're going to do. But uh, I strongly recommend that this commission needs additional information regarding the phase two contract. And if you could say, well, what in the world could that be? Uh, some of it's been somewhat more clarified uh, about the full scope of options with Caltrans or the California Transportation Commission and the Surface Transportation Board. But I'm uh, concerned about the, the exposure to litigation, uh, for one, and what this impact might be if we move on this the way it is. And uh, I know that Progressive knows it, um, it um, has, it, it really has access to Watsonville in a seven mile uh, radius or so now with uh, the storm damages that is north of Watsonville right now. So I, um, I do not think that that's going to make them pull out of this or anything. I think that they would be a good partner if they should, if we should move along with this. So I would like to, um, and I know I, 
I'm not one to say just do it, do study it again, but for me, I need more information about some of uh, basic issues on this, a few of which I've named, and so I'd like to just delay a decision on this until our March uh, 15th meeting, or whatever that meeting date is that's coming up in March, that we, ha we delay this decision on the preferred scenario until our March meeting. Oh, sorry, you mean the, the, license. The, the license, excuse me, to, uh, until our March meeting. Second. Second. Motion, uh, second by Commissioner Mulhern, and I'm gonna start uh, on this end this time. I, I'll be really brief. I don't support the motion. I think we have the information that we need to make the decision now. And if I thought if we had more time would really give us different information or allow us a different kind of a contract that would somehow give us more flexibility, I would support the motion, but I don't think that's really likely. So I, I'm gonna vote no on this motion and hope we can actually de decide this today. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Coonerty. Uh, yeah, based on my other comments, I think it's time for us to make a decision and move forward. Commissioner Leopold. Uh, I don't I don't support the motion. Uh, I understand the, the need uh, that people have for additional information. This uh, change of uh, common carrier, it, was, it should have been an administrative function. Uh, and we, uh, we tried to make lots of ways uh, to um, uh, address people's concerns and give plenty of time to answer questions. Uh, uh, Progressive Rail has done everything they said they were gonna do and uh, I'm ready to move forward with it. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. No comment. Comment. Um, uh, Thank you. Commissioner Mulhern. Um, commit, if we were to initiate phase two of this contract, it will commit the RTC to an aggressive capital program that isn't currently envisioned in any of our plans. Um, as per the contract, phase two of this agreement, we will pay for <coughs> or cause payment for repairs from mile post seven to mile post 31.39. So the entire length of the rail corridor will need to be reconstituted within the next three years. I'm sorry, that's been feasible. I also believe that there are some other questions about our rights and responsibilities uh, within this rail corridor that haven't been answered. For example, what would happen were we to allow Progressive Rail to maintain their freight easement and their freight operations, but not improve the rail corridor north of milepost seven? It's a question that hasn't yet been asked or answered, and I think that is a legitimate question, what our liabilities might be should we not continue with phase two. It's just been a, <clears throat> assumed that we would continue with uh, transportation services on the corridor, which I might add to all of our rail advocates out there, only encompasses excursion rail, um, and uh, which actually satisfies the requirements of Prop 116, uh, which our project was only envisioned to be a dinner train from Santa Cruz to Davenport. And in fact, the CTC waived the commuter rail requirements of Prop <laughs> 116 so that they could approve our project of a dinner train from Santa Cruz to Davenport. So I think that there are, there's a big gap between uh, the approved project and the intent to continue with some sort of commuter rail project on the rail line. And I think that there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered regarding our liabilities and responsibilities. So I will be supporting the motion. Commissioner Johnson. Well, I, uh, excuse me, I think freight service from mileposts uh, three, which uh, serves Watsonville is important and keeping that intact uh, allows us to do this with this measure. So I'll, I'll support the measure. <clears throat> Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Probably having witnessed a uh, majority of uh, the activity with the progressive in Watsonville, um, I'm, I'm not quite clear on what kind of litigation or potential litigation as a result of the initial contract for the phase two to just be rolled in. Um, I'm still gonna be listening to weigh in a little bit more about how I'm going to decide on this particular item for the vote. Thank you. Commissioner Boutrin. Um I'm supportive of Bruce's um, motion and I've long contended that our main focus should be on Watsonville. I'm not certain. Certainly we haven't had um, train activity going north for a long time. Uh, the idea that it's all of a sudden going to develop, I think we should sit back and figure out a little bit more what this contract means. Uh, but more importantly, I'd like to give room to our new executive director to determine that. I think that we've recognized already that there's a new person at the helm and this is a contract that is going to influence how we proceed for the next 10, 20 years. We, we have no idea at this point. 
I think for the person at the helm, they should be the ones that make those recommendations, make themselves satisfied that for this agency, it is a good contract. So I totally agree with Bruce. We need that room. Um, thank you. Commissioner Cabot. You bet. If you could just uh, clarify the motion. Uh, right, make sure I have right now in front of us is item number two, which is uh, grant St. Paul and Pacific Railroad a license to use the Santa Cruz branch rail line to provide excursion service in addition to freight service as specified under 2.4.1 of the Administration of Coordination License Agreement. So we're voting on that agreement. And, and, and what uh, Commissioner McPherson has asked for is to postpone the vote to allow more time to look into some concerns that's been brought up by various members on the panel and allow the new executive director to have conversation with other agencies that might be able to, to okay. make people understand and feel more comfortable before they vote. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be against the motion because I'm ready to vote on going forward. Thank you. I do have yeah, go ahead. Well, I actually have a, a question because I um, too am, I'm a little bit conflicted here about the need to move forward today and the kind of information that we might be able to get in order to make this decision. I'm not uh, necessarily opposed to moving forward, um, but I would like to know, based upon um, maybe Commissioner McPherson, the qu kinds of questions that you have and um, Commissioner Mullern, the questions related specifically to potential legal challenges, how realistic is it that we'll get additional information? Some of my colleagues seem to think not, and um, others do. And so I'm, I'm feeling a bit conflicted here about um, how to proceed. So it would be helpful to hear from staff um, in response to the, um, the idea that we, we might have some additional data gathering to do the re reality of that? Well, I can certainly try. Um, I've contacted the CTC this week. Um, I've also received letters from them. Um, they seem pretty, um, pretty certain that um, we would have to pay back the funding if we didn't continue with rail. Now, that said, you know, what does that mean with respect to this contract and excursion rail, and, and is there a nexus between the two? Um, they are not as clear when, when those questions are asked. Um, I don't know that if I ask them again and present to them in a different way if they would be more clear or not. Um, the Surface Transportation Board, um, I have less confidence in being able to get answers from, from them. They, they seem to be pretty non-committal and hard to get in touch with, but I can certainly try. I can also, you know, approach Progressive Rail and see, um, you know, what their feelings are about, you know, backing out of this agreement if, if, if we were not to, to grant a transportation easement. Um, I, I do want to remind, um, the commission that, you know, we, I plan on being very serious about my fiduciary responsibilities. One of the first things I asked um, when I came on board was, you know, what really is our financial liability towards, um, you know, the progress rail agreement, you know, and I've looked at the cost estimates of trying to get the rail line um, between zero and seven. Um, um, to, to a point where they could do excursion travel, and I've also looked at it from seven to, you know, 31 point whatever uh, it is to the end. And, you know, I have my own concerns about putting together a funding plan to do that sort of work. And I've contacted our legal counsel and said, you know, if I cannot afford to do all these repairs, as far as I can tell in looking at the agreement, is there a penalty or, you know, some sort of damages against the RTC? And the way the contract's written, there is not. You know, and this kind of goes back to um, Commissioner Bertrand's um, um, concerns regarding the Capitola trestle. Um, you know, I take that very seriously too. Safety is, is my utmost importance. There is no way that we are going to put a train over a bridge that is unsafe. That said, I don't have the funding to do major capital repairs on a bridge of that nature, but if I've got 
an opportunity to apply for state funding to do repairs on the Capitola trestle, um, then I might have the ability to do that sort of work. But if the CTC looks at me and says, well, you put in an, uh, an application to repair the Capitola trestle, but you have no train service, why would I possibly spend money on the Capitola trestle? Then I put myself between a rock and a hard place. I don't see them as looking towards making capital improvements on a line that there's no rail on. So I can ask the questions, and I certainly will go back and try to provide an oper you know, a way of presenting this differently if you think that that will be helpful and if this motion does pass. But I'm not sure that there's going to be a whole lot more information available on February 7th or at our March, I think March 15th meeting. But before you vote, I would like to also make sure that we provide clarification that our next meeting is February 7th and not in March because I would like, if this motion was to pass, I would like to come back February 7th and not wait till March. So Mr. May, Mendez, go ahead. If I may add uh, one, one clarification, because it was a comment made that the uh, California Transportation Commission uh, waived the requirement for uh, passenger rail on the line. And this might help to, to uh, also clarify why the CTC is so firm in, in, in its letters that we've been, we've been receiving. Now, Proposition 116, state law, the state law that passed by the voters. Uh, so uh, the language in that state law states that uh, there was $11 million available to Santa Cruz <laughs> County for, for, two, for two possibilities. One was intercity passenger rail projects connecting the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville, or other rail projects <clears throat> in Santa Cruz County which facilitate recreational, commuter, intercity, or intercounty travel. So it is written in state law that the RTC had that option. In order for the RTC to have that option to use recreational rail service to access that money, the RTC had to match the Prop 116 money dollar for dollar. So uh, this agency did uh, approve you know, $10 million in uh, um, 2000 uh, towards both the purchase of the rail line and improvements on, on the rail line, and also uh, Congressman Sam Farr uh, uh, secured a million and a half dollars towards the project. So that, that was how this RTC then was able to buy, uh, to match the, uh, the Prop 116 funding and have that option to acquire this line uh, with recreational rail service and not just regular intercity passenger rail service. So, the, this, so it's, it wasn't a CTC guideline that they could waive, it's state law. So if, and part of what the CTC has told us if you want to have approval of using that money for something that isn't a rail project because it is state law passed by the voters, the legislature can, the state legislature can change that. It is written into, into Prop 116, but it's not, a, it's not a simple majority of the state legislature. It's, it's a super majority. So thank you. I'm gonna to go to Commissioner Coonerty. Sure, I have two questions. So in general, when we're under threat of litigation, we should move into closed session. So my answer, my question to the attorney is, are we under credible threat of litigation that it would warrant a closed session discussion? So I think at this time we don't, we haven't done an analysis to support that today we could enter into closed session. Um, I think that what's being requested is that we do an analysis to determine whether in our opinion there's a significant threat that we would be facing litigation if we didn't proceed with a phase two um, license. Part of that would likely involve um, the executive director's communications with Progressive to determine whether that's a likely outcome. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, then the second question I have is for the executive director. So uh, to Commissioner Bertrand's point, um, this was your recommendation under your signature to enter into this con phase two of the contract. So um, uh, there's been a point that you need to go out and get more information and, and be m made more comfortable in your decision, but uh, the report today before us was your recommendation to us that we should move forward. So 
is there something that we don't know that is causing you to, to change that recommendation or, or did what you tell us today is you, you believe we need to move forward? I still believe the right decision is to move forward with the, the recommendation that was provided in the staff report because there's really no penalty written in the contract with respect to if we cannot complete the repairs. So if the, the repairs on the line exceed the funding available to us, then I don't see any plan being provided by Progressive Rail for, for a portion of the rail line that cannot be funded and brought up to class one standard as something that this, I would recommend approval of in the future. So I don't, I see it as an opportunity to have a rail provider on the line to be able to maintain the line and help maintain the line for us. And also meeting the CTC's requirement so that I can apply for additional funds to continue to maintain that rail line. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, my comments on ours is, you know, we, we, we just got done passing the unified core study by unanimous vote, and I think that sends a strong message. My concern as the chair is that I've got uh, concerns from other members who have wanted to ask for time, another 30 days possibly, to, to make sure some things are fully vetted. I think at this point, after doing this for as long as we've all done this, I don't see how that can be detrimental to make sure that we make possibly the same kind of vote. So I will be supporting the measure also. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and call for a roll call vote. <coughs> Commissioner Rotkin? No. Commissioner Coonerty? No. Commissioner Leopold? No. Commissioner Brown? No. Commissioner Bottorf? Yes. Commissioner McPherson? Yes. Commissioner uh, Alternate Milhern? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? No. Commissioner Bertrand? Yes. Commissioner Caput. No. Motion passes six to five. Is that my correct count? No. I'm sorry. The motion fails six to five. Sorry. Uh, okay. I want to move that we. Uh, I move for, that we approve the staff recommendation for item number two. Second. Is there any further discussion on that from anyone? Uh, if I vote no, it's just because I think we should. Um, I'm just not as comfortable as I should be, and I think I could I could be more comfortable in 30 days. So I'm going to be voting no. Any other comments, Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Um, regardless of the outcome, the information I think is still uh, worthy of of receiving to the commission. So please um, let's have that information be made available to us. No objection to that. Any other comments? Uh, we'll go ahead with the roll call vote. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Commissioner Coonerty? Aye. Commissioner Leopold? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Bottorf? No. Commissioner McPherson? No. Commissioner Milhern? Alternate Milhern? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Commissioner Bertrand? Yes. Commissioner Caput? So I decided again here, huh? No. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 you, you, knew you had all the fame there. That motion passes <laughs> six to five. Uh, with that, we're on a time deadline, so we're going to. Seven to four. Seven to four. Did I miss? Yeah. I missed it. Okay. Thank you for the correct numbers. That passes seven to four. Um, let's move on to the um, last item on our agenda, which is. Let me find the agenda again. Uh, item twenty-one. Does there a staff report? Mm -hmm. Is there a staff report on item 21? You should make it really short. We did read the report. Yes, okay. This is just a Could I ask people to please be quiet as you're leaving the room so we can hear? Okay. Thank you. So it's recommended the RC make a de determination that convicted bidding for railroad crossing signal work on the Santa Cruz branch rail line would be unavailing, would not produce uh, an advantage, and would not be in the public interest, and to authorize the executive director to enter into a prevailing wage no bid contract agreement with Progressive Rail, uh, slash St. Paul Pacific Railroad, in the amount of $81,373 <coughs> to complete railroad crossing signal repairs at Beach Street in Watsonville, which resulted uh, because the signal uh, crossing was hit by a, by a truck that was del uh, delivering a local, a local business. We do have footage uh, of that, and um, the art 
uh, staff uh, learned in December 2018, not well, like the staff report said December 2017, that uh, Iowa Pacific actually did not um, file uh, a claim against the insurance company for that tr trucking firm. So staff and legal counsel are working to get the information necessary to do that. So it is the, so that the, and work to try to recover all the costs associated with that repair. But in the meantime, the repairs need to be made and the RTC has the option to enter into a no bid um, prevailing wage agreement with Progressive Rail uh, to do that. So. Pending any staff, uh, co any public comments, I move the staff recommendation. Second. Any questions? The, the, the comment that I want to make, uh, I'm sorry, this thing back and forth. Um, the staff had told me to make sure that we've got them included in the loop of the repairs um, so that our public works is involved in the process and whatever permits or anything else that you may need on behalf of the city of Watsonville. That, that's correct. We received that communication as well. So. Any other comments? Anyone from the public like to weigh in on this topic? Thank you, Commissioners. Lowell Hurst, City of Watsonville. It's very important that we move forward with uh, these repairs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, we'll go for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, and we are adjourned to the next meeting. Good Thank job, Chair. Uh, closed session, huh? Calendar until 2.30. No, no, no. <laughs> Seriously. Every time I say one.